meeting is being recorded. All right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the January 13th, 2021 meeting of the Ascension Parish Planning Commissioner Commission. All commissioners with the exception of Ms. Hutchins are currently present. I would ask everybody to uh, place your hand over your heart for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I think the protocol, Ms. Stacy, can you read the entire agenda for tonight's meeting, please? We have the election of officers, um, chairman for 2021 and vice chairman for 2021. We have the staff report, which has the subdivision status uh, for January 2021. We have the approval or denial of the minutes and written decisions of the December 9th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. For the consent agenda, we have affidavit of mortgage declaration for Pedro and Maria. Alpha Row, Alpha Row, Lot 116231 Highway 44, Gonzales, Louisiana. Affidavit of Mortgage Declaration, Kristen Bro, Lot 1A1, 12233 George Lambert Road, Santa Monica, Louisiana. Affidavit of Mortgage Declaration, Timothy N. Taylor, Lot B12A18381 Paul Road, Santa Monica, Louisiana. Final plan approval, Pelican Crossing, fifth plan filing, quality engineering and surveying, LLC, District 2. We have public hearing to approve or deny the following preliminary facts. Claire Ford, Brooklyn Taylor Incorporated, District 8. Pleasant Roost Industrial Park, first filing, quality engineering and surveying, LLC, Council District 3. Windermere Crossing, Quality Engineering and Surveying, LLC, Council District 9. And under Old Business, we have Anson P. Tomplay Property, Lots 5A and 5C, Family Partition, Louisiana Land Surveying, Incorporated, Council District 6. All right. Thank you, Ms. Stacy. I'd like to move on with staff. Please introduce themselves. Stacey Webb, Council Secretary, I'm sorry, Planning Commission Secretary. Eric Poche, Parish Planner. Gerald Fouillet, Director of Planning and Development. Sean Chirou is here for you, O'Neill. O'Neill Parish and Parish Attorney. All right, and for all of you watching, um, if you want to participate with a public comment, the call-in number is 225. 621-8636 with participant code 939496. That's 221-621-8636 and then enter participant code 939496. All right, the next item on the agenda is the election of officers for the 2021 year. Uh, first is the election of chairman. Uh, Mr. Dumas, do you have a motion for the election of chairman? I'd like to make a motion that we, uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, recommend Matt Pryor to continue as chairman. This works beautifully. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Dumas, second by Mr. Furman. All in favor, please raise your hand to signify. Any in opposition, please raise your hand. Uh, very good. I accept and uh, I'm elected. Then, all right, for the election of vice chairman, I'll make a motion to elect Julio Dumas as vice chairman. Do I have a second on that? Second by, um, by Robert. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any in opposition, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised. Very good. Item number six is the chairman's comments. Um, we have, I have no comments tonight. Item number seven is the public comment on any agenda item. Again, that number to call in if you'd like to talk about any of the agenda items or leave a comment is 225-621-8636 and participant code is 939496. So 621-8636, area code 225. Uh, participant code is 939496. And staff, how long is that line open? It'd be either 15 minutes or 30 minutes with Johnson. 15 minutes? Usually 15 for uh, committee meetings. 15 nice. for committee meetings. I, I 
think we should do 30 minutes myself. Well, if it's committee meetings and that's the standard, we'll stick with uh, 15 minutes. So do we have I, any comments, uh, Mr. Poche, that we can, that you'd like to read in the record? Yes, I have several emails that I would like to read into the record. First email is from Ms. Angela Stanga and her concern is over Windermere Crossing. Her email reads, the Planning Commission will address the approval of the subdivision Windermere Crossing January 13th. The one entrance exit to the proposed development and the forced right exit onto Roddy Road will cause a massive increase in traffic on the already substandard roads of Cannon and O'Neill. As a resident of O'Neill and employee of the school system, I travel these roads daily to and from East Ascension High School. The amount of traffic during all times, especially peak traffic times, is substantial. The posted speed limit of 25 miles per hour and 35 miles per hour on Camp and O'Neill, respectively, of which hardly any drivers adhere to. The roads simply cannot handle the increase in amount of vehicle traffic that the new development and its proposed right turn only out of, out of riding. Next email is from Mr. Jeremy Terrio. His concern is also over Windermere Crossing. Hi, my name is Jeremy Terrio, and I would like to comment about the Windermere Crossing development. I have lived in Ascension Parish for over 30 years and on Roddy Road since 2014. This proposed project has a single entrance against, against, entrance against your subdivision guidelines. The entrance is further restricted because of LOS reductions at Black Bayou Road. Will this project not add 100 trips without any off-site improvements, such as roundabouts? By sending everyone south, this will not further increase traffic. This will not further increase traffic on the narrow Cannon Road and also down Roddy Road at the next intersections. Why was this next major intersection at Roddy and Bayou North Seas not included in this study? As you can see, I have several questions regarding traffic because I live on Roddy and see the traffic. We sit for two and three minutes on the regular occurrence during peak traffic times to allow for safe conditions. Look at table eight from the ERA. Follower density will increase by nearly 25% on riding, which is rated a D. With actual riding travel speeds of 35 to 45 miles per hour with some assumptions, I estimate the gap time will be reduced from 10.1 seconds to around six to seven seconds. When studies show the acceptable gap time for traffic is six to seven seconds, this roughly a 40% reduction in gap time will be significantly felt. When I saw 103 tiny lots on approximately 28 acres of land, I was surprised. My first question was answered by note five on the plat reading, all lots shown here on have the minimum lot size and lot frontage. I understand development and progress, but when someone builds something to the minimal code or max density, do we not allow them to build the worst possible thing allowed by law? I encourage you to consider the traffic and also our flood basin. Let's have responsible growth. How bad is it if this development recognizes the traffic impact was severe enough to self-impose a no left turn entrance? Would this, would this just not force traffic, force the traffic problem further down the road on someone else and without improvements to their roads? Why would they not reduce the number of lots to get the trips to an acceptable level for left turns? I ask you to deny this approval as it was two years ago. Signed, Jeremy Terrio. Next email is from Ms. Jessica Kane of Kuhn. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Her email reads, please do not approve the Windermere Crossing plat. Construction of this subdivision will cause my property to flood. One house recently built next to me has caused my yard to retain water. Over 100 new houses would be catastrophic. Also, the subdivision will add 200 plus vehicles driving on daily on Roddy and Cannon and O'Neill Road. Roddy cannot handle the traffic. O'Neill and Cannon are substandard. None of these roads are in good enough condition to handle current traffic, much less added traffic. Thank you. Next email is from Ms. Rebecca Mobile. Her concern is also the Windermere Crossing subdivision. I would like to start by stating this Windermere Crossing does not meet code having only one exit. I, and I am concerned as to why it's plat has made it to this meeting. The code states that subdivisions should have more than one exit street. There is no precedence because each subdivision plat is to be treated as a case by case basis. I have been told by more than one parish council member that they are concerned about being sued by the developers if they do not approve the subdivision plat as long as it meets code. This makes me feel hopeless for our parish's development. 
if every inch of our parish can be developed into small lot subdivisions as long as they meet code, this would mean we could have no planning of infrastructure, never catch up with roads, schools, etc. Then this was brought to my attention by Lance Brock, zoning official. The zoning office is responsible for administering the Ascension Parish Development Code 2003 in order to guide development in the parish as outlined in the 12 principles adopted by the council. One, protect public safety and property. Two, manage growth. Three, preserve the rural character of the parish. I'll stop there for now because those three principles are my concerns about the building of this subdivision. Number one, protect public safety and property. A, one road exit causes danger. Any need of evacuation of 103 homes that can only turn right out of this subdivision, impeding emergency vehicles, fire trucks, ambulances, police cars, possible problems with school buses. B, pedestrian. There are no sidewalks, not to mention shovels on Roddy Cannon, O'Neill, or Black Bayou Road, adding 103 small lot houses will increase the foot, foot traffic. Anyone in this area knows how scary it is driving these roads with walkers and bike riders. Two deaths have occurred on Black Bayou, one pedestrian, one bike rider. C, property damage by flooding existing homes in the parish near the subdivision and further down Black Bayou. With 103 houses built on and very small lots, where is the water to go? And the property will build up at least 36 to 48 inches. Two, manage growth. A, please wait for roads to be finished. In the two years since the subdivision was adopted the first time, the only progress with improvements to Roddy Road has been removal of the trees. It would be fair to say that it will take at least five more years for the road construction to be done. Why would you add 200 or more cars at this time? B, improvement and drainage should be made to these areas before build subdivision on wetland property. According to an elevation map, most of this property is lowland and swamps after it rains. Number three, preserve the rural character of the parish. I will conclude by asking the developers to please consider larger lot sizes with bigger yards for kids to play. This will result in fewer houses and less of an impact on neighboring properties. Thank you for your time. Please take care of our parish. Rebecca Mabil. Let's see. Next is Mr. Jason Gillery. He writes, his concern is for Windermere Crossing as well. To whom it may concern, I'm writing in opposition to the proposed development of Windermere Crossing. My home faces Cannon Road, and while I do not have the official results of the traffic study, I do have a genuine concern for the traffic realities that occur on Cannon Road between Roddy and Highway 44. Let me start with the posted speed limit. Along this section of Cannon, the posted speed limit is now 25 miles per hour. Now, what I'm certain the traffic impact study won't show is the actual speed at which most vehicles maintain while traveling this road. I can assure you it's well over 25 miles per hour. Just in the last couple of years, I've seen evidence of vehicles having left the roadway and demolished a neighbor's fence, which has since completely been removed. And this same home has had to replace its mailbox due to a driver who lost control and left the road. It's no secret the Cannon Road is not wide enough to accommodate the current amount of traffic that travels that road daily. I can only imagine what it would be like if you add another 200 vehicles coming from and going to Windermere on any given day. I reviewed the meeting packet and noticed that there is only one entrance exit in the subdivision layout, which also prohibits left turn exits. I'd like to know what route those would be left turners will take. My guess is the path of least resistance, Cannon Road to O'Neill or Highway 44. The preliminary plan also calls out future connection to Cannon Road after Cannon Road improvements are made. What are those improvement plans and when are they expected to be implemented? Allow me to pose this scenario. Let's assume this passes and Windermere is built. I'm assuming it will be in the Central School District based on the current subdivision layout. Where will the school bus stop, load, offload children? If it stops on right, I have concern for the children's safety. If the bus enters the neighborhood, it's forced to turn right when exiting the neighborhood, then the path to Central would take that bus down Cannon. Again, another safety concern for the children. School bus is approximately eight and a half feet wide. Cannon Road is about 16 and a half feet wide. The forced right turn from the pros neighborhood puts children in an increased risk situation that they may not otherwise be subject to if the roadways can support such additional traffic. I'd be more open to accepting the idea of this development after plan road improvements for surrounding roads are completed. But the current condition of the surrounding roads, Roddy, unsafe egress, Cannon, unsafe width, O'Neill, unsafe with road edges breaking apart and falling off, realistically will not hold up to the increased traffic. I see too many close calls on this road to support a development that will undoubtedly draw new residents to an unfamiliar area where they are unaware 
at the exist existing risk level of traveling these roads. An additional point regarding schools. Are there estimates in place that show the influx of new individual families that will affect the public schools? Can the district accommodate more students or are we enticing people to move here only to find out whether there's not a spot in school for their kids? I've spoken to an elderly, elderly neighbor who has lived in the area his whole life. He is very familiar with the subject property. He knows how wet the property is and how low it is, albeit not in its entirety, but low lying nonetheless. If the property is developed, it will send water to homes and otherwise would not be at risk. First time there's a heavy traffic, there's a heavy downpour to construction. Dean the pond will blow air to accommodate watersheds like putting lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig. That's the end of uh, Mr. Guillory's time. The next email is from. Oh, I think this is Mr. Symbol of Debt. Sent an email to Councilman Dow Wagsback. Says, Good day, Mr. Wagsback. I am emailing you today with concerns about the Windermere Crossing development that is coming before the, the Council for consideration. My name is December Ladette. I'm an adjacent property owner and resident. I also drive a school bus to the Ascension Parish School Board. I drive my route daily through this particular area, so I know the roads and the shape they are in and the amount of traffic that is already existing without adding 103 homes and 200 plus additional cars. I have seen the proposed plant. My first concern is the number of lots they're trying to fit to the development. It would be so much nicer to make the lots wider and houses a bit farther apart for nicer and bigger homes so that they would not just be starter homes but fair for homes for growing families with room for off street parking and big yards for the kids to play instead of in the streets. But this is wishful thinking. I know as a developer, it's just that developers and not residents of the communities they are developing. On street parking presents particular challenges for the school bus as well as other parish emergency vehicles. The other concern is that there is only one entrance exit to the, to the development and that is on Roddy Road which is in horrible shape as of right now with much work, much needed work coming but not starting and how long to completion. My question, why not wait till the road is improved before adding 200 plus car, cars to it daily? Second question, there should be two exits for this development. Why would you approve it with only one? Third question, if the is not wide enough for the entrance, why would it be acceptable for 200 car, plus cars per day onto Roddy Road with first intersection and opportunity to exit Roddy onto Cannon, which is deemed unfit to carry that traffic. Next street over O'Neill, which is in different pair crumbling like Roddy Road, which cannot and should not have to handle the additional traffic. We, the residents, are not asking to haul new developments, only that they be in step with our infrastructure. We see many developments coming up, but the roads are not receiving the same attention as every piece of empty land left in the parish. And if the ordinances are tying the council members hands, please let's change the ordinance that dictates how big the lots are and where and when they can be built. It seems that the houses keep coming and coming smaller and smaller lots with bigger and bigger developments and the roads, streets and schools are left to play catch up. I ask that this development be halted until, until such time that two safe entrances and exits can be utilized where they can turn right or left entering or exiting the development and after Canon has been widened to handle additional traffic and after the road improvements that are needed and planned are completed. Further ask that they make the lots bigger, therefore less houses for less impact on adjacent community and existing neighborhood. Please consider my concerns and bring them to the adjacent community and existing. Please consider my concerns and bring them to the attention of the other, other council members as you take this development under consideration. I also need information on how to attend the virtual meeting. Uh, please reply with invitation to the meeting. Sincerely, December the debt. Next email is from Ms. Connie Burke. She is also concerned about uh, Windermere Crossing subdivision. Oh, Christopher Burke, I'm sorry, Christopher and Connie Burke. My name is Christopher Burke and I live at 41390 Cannon Road. I'm opposed to the approval of this subdivision due to the substandard size of Cannon Road and the addition, additional traffic that this del development will direct onto Cannon. Cannon Road is extremely narrow, only 17 feet wide, so narrow that it does not even have a center line. The act of passing an on oncoming vehicle on this road must be done with extreme caution. When passing large pickup trucks or utility delivery vehicles, it can only be done safely if both vehicles ride the outer white line next to the ditch. Occasionally, this does not happen. If collisions occur, someone must go off the road, possibly going into the ditch or striking 
objects along the roadside. My neighbors have lost side mirrors for collisions with oncoming vehicles. I have found my side mirror in, in I have found a side mirror in my ditch and just three weeks ago. My daughter's friend pulled into my driveway with a side mirror hanging from her vehicle. A large pickup truck was traveling toward her and was not hugging the ditch on their side, which left her no room on her side of the road. She had to make a decision, hit the oncoming vehicle or hit the trash can. She chose the trash can. Adding a major subdivision with 103 homes that will place additional traffic on a very narrow, substandard road will be poor planning and irresponsible. I propose that this development be rejected until the local infrastructure is prepared to safely handle the additional traffic. Next email is from Ms. Patty Manuel. Her concern is also for Windermere Crossing Development. This email is to address concerns that we have with the Windermere Crossing Development that is coming before the Council tonight for consideration. As we are not opposed to development in our parish or people selling their property to whom or whomever they want to, we think that this parish needs to address and handle the problems it already has with its infrastructure, drainage, and school overcrowding. My husband, John M. Manuel, and myself, Patricia A. Manuel, are adjacent property owners and longtime residents of Ascension Parish. We have seen the proposed plat and are concerned with several things at this time. The number of lots that is being proposed in this development is, is one. Our parish keeps approving developments with smaller and smaller lots. Why not approve developments with larger homes, larger lot sizes, and better ingress, egress? The traffic concerns is also one of our biggest concerns. Back in 2016, the parish approved a traffic impact fee on all permits in our parish. Where has all that money gone as we do not see that much improvement in our parish regarding our roads? On a daily basis, the traffic is getting worse and the roads are getting terrible to drive on. Why not wait until the improvements are done to Roddy Road to approve this development? One of our biggest concerns is the major subdivision development with one, well, only one exit. It's my understanding that our parish has an ordinance and requires two exits and a major subdivision, so why would the council even consider approval of this plat plan? Not only that, but with one entrance and exit, it is my understanding that this exit will only be used for right turns. In reading the CSRS report, page three, item B, it states that guidelines and subdivisions should have more than one entrance, but due to Cannon Road being too narrow, this development will only have one. It also states that apparently that they use as example the Windsor Park development on LA-42 is a similar situation to this project. Riding Road does not have any of the features that LA-42 has now, and LA-42 will have after completion. Also, when you divert the traffic to right turn, only we see several problems here. First being the first intersection, also shortest route to Airline Highway or Black Bay Road is Cannon Road, which has already been determined to be too narrow to facilitate traffic from this proposed development. Second, not only will this divert traffic onto Cannon Road, but also O'Neill Road, which is in essence the same as Cannon Road, too. Narrow for the traffic, and also the edges of the road are crumbling now with no shoulder to get on. Currently on both Cannon Road and O'Neill Road, you have to pull over as far as you can and nearly stop a meeting oncoming traffic. Our next concern is the drainage situation, not only in our area, but parish-wide. As more and more developments are approved in our parish, we're causing more and more drainage issues. We have lived on the adjacent property for 39 years, and in the 2016 flood, we had approximately four to five feet water in front of our property, and the water coming within two to three inches of getting my husband's shop. We understand this is the highest the water has ever been in our parish, but as we keep developing in our parish in areas that are flood prone and already have drainage issues, where is this water going to go? As we live next to the public drainage canal that runs into Black Bayou, this development will be also be next to our also be next to it. Our concern is with most of these lots already at 11 feet and above floodplain that they are not allowed to add 36 inches of fill. Also, the public drainage canal needs to be clean and dug. We just do not want more water diverted on our property. That's, Ms. Man that's the end of Ms. Manuel's uh, time. The next email is from Ms. Kelly Jean. Her, her concern is also with Windermere Crossing subdivision. I was made recently aware of the proposal for the 103 lot subdivision in our area near my newly built home off of O'Neill Lane. After reviewing, reviewing the layout the proposed plan, I'm concerned as a homeowner that my property will be significantly affected should this subdivision come to fruition. Not only does the lot visibly collect water from heavy downpours, a significant portion of the layout is considered potential non-jurisdictional wetlands. As a, paying, as a tax paying 
citizen of Ascension Parish, a military veteran, that would indicate to me hands off. This area and Black Bayou cannot sustain a major development such as this without negatively affecting the surrounding property. When the next big rain event occurs, and I'm not even referring to the 2016 flood here, the water will have to go somewhere despite the proposed lift station to a treatment plant. I've seen Black Bayou at its max level. It covers Black Bayou and floods nearby homes. Now this developer is proposing additional drainage into Black Bayou. Regarding the traffic nightmare that this subdivision would create since the developer is proposing left turn restriction out of the subdivision onto Roddy Road, this would ultimately divert traffic to Cannon and O'Neill for travelers going toward Central Primary School. These roads in their current condition are not equipped to handle an influx of traffic that this would ultimately generate. I hope these genuine concerns are taken into consideration in approving or denying Windermere Crossing's preliminary plat this evening's meeting. The next email is from Ms. Stacy Villner and her concern uh, let's see, make sure I get this right uh, it's got yes it's it's also for uh, for a uh, Windermere Crossing proposal concerns this was addressed to Mr. Fournier. I wanted to provide you with a copy of the letter I sent to Dow Wax Pack. Please take into consideration the poor conditions of the surrounding roads, Roddy, Cannon, O'Neill, the safety issue of having only one entrance exit, floodplain drainage issues that this would cause, and the number of houses and sizes of lots they're proposing. I'm not against development. I do, however, have concerns when our infrastructure never seems to be prepared to handle said developments. Why couldn't it be suggested to go with bigger lot size for more rural type living that matches the surrounding area instead of cookie cutter? homes built on top of each other. This would also help with the traffic issues since it would be less number of people in that location. Even with this idea, the roads still need to be improved before we add homes. In my opinion, I noticed a few principles on your website. Protect public safety and property, manage growth, preserve the rural character of the parish, discourage development in the 100-year floodplain. I just thought I'd share them as a reminder. This is this is Ms. Villeneuve's letter to, to Councilman Wags back. Dear Dow, I am writing in hopes of gaining your support to fight the approval of the proposed development of Windermere Crossing. At the very least, please support the fact that the surrounding road conditions need to be improved before adding 100 home subdivision, i.e. Roddy Cannon and O'Neill. I have concerns about the one entrance exit. Is it safe to only provide one entrance exit? There's no way Cannon can handle an entrance exit, which I, which I see has since been removed from the proposal. With the right only exit, those needing to travel north to Galvez, Santa Maria Airline, Interstate, etc., will be diverted to Cannon, and O'Neill has cut through options. These roads simply cannot handle this additional traffic. Cannon can barely fit two cars at once. I travel O'Neill daily. Edges of the road are crumbling into the ditches. On most sections of O'Neill, if a car is coming towards me, I have to drive on the edge of the road to ensure there's room for both of us to fit. If there's anything you can do to help, I'd really appreciate it. This is Stacy Billner. This next email is from Ms. Jada Lee of Jada Burke. O'Neill, this is a reference to Windermere Crossing subdivision as well. Good morning, my name is Jada Burke. I currently reside at Little Peace, at Little Place off of O'Neill. I heard that a possible subdivision is in the plans off of Cannon Road. I do not agree with the plans, especially that Cannon Road is so narrow and it would be so hard to divert traffic. When we have heavy rain, the stop sign on O'Neill that crosses, that crosses over Cannon and floods every time, but it's passable. That part is what concerns me because if it's already flooding in that part, imagine what could happen if a subdivision is built right there. The water could possibly go higher and get to where we cannot pass it. I don't believe that O'Neill and Cannon Road have the structure, especially when we already are crowded out there, out here. O'Neill Road is uneven and is caving in on both sides since they dug a ditch out. Please consider the safety of the residents that live in that area. Thank you for your time and considering reading this email, Jada Burke. Any more? Yes, there's two more. 
Oh, that's what they give me that Christy Adams. That one you got there, I think I've read just about all of them. Next email is from Ms. Christy Mc, Mc, McAdams. Uh, her concern is over Buzzard Roost, Industrial Development on Highway 30. Discussion items that she would like to consider is concerns with noise level pollution, negative impacts on industrial site, concerns with designated buffer area, proposed plan to create a buffer, type of buffer in the plans, fence, trees, plans for ditch located behind on our properties, possibly needs to be removed. Next email is Mr. Norman Latham. I do not see where it references a subdivision. I can only assume, ma'am? Mr. Latham? Oh, it is a subdivision. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Mr. Latham is concerned about the Buzzard Roost subdivision. It states, uh, my concerns are such drainage. The drainage in the neighborhood is already fair to poor. We're building behind our properties tied to our drainage system. If so, who is responsible for maintenance? Will it get covered? I am concerned if what manufacturer will let run into the ditches near our homes? Will the elevation of the new buildings be greater than the elevation of our properties? Will the grading be done away from our homes? Sewage, will the properties have on-site treatments, treatment plants? If so, that will allow for businesses to run the water through the drains of our ditches if, in fact, those businesses are tied in. Will they then cover the ditches? What will be their maintenance requirements? Thank you, Mr. Norman. Late. Okay. So last one what about the home? Okay. That's all we got. Okay. I have one last one is from Miss Debbie Satoon and she is an adjacent landowner with comments from Windermere Subdivision. My name is Debbie Mobile Satoon. I'm a retired professional project manager in civil and environmental engineering on those eight acres of land off of O'Neill Road near Black Bayou. About 50 acres of the same area has been owned by my family, naming my great-great-grandfather Norman Young since the 1830s. My recently inherited land is adjacent to the northwest corner of the proposed Windermere development near Black Bayou. The main issue at hand is whether Ascension Parish is growing faster than its infrastructure can support. Many residents believe it is. I have concerns about public safety, traffic on substandard roads, and preserving the tranquil rural nature of my property to enjoy in my retirement. Since I and possibly other landowners received formal notice only about two weeks ago, we are at a disadvantage. Given the short notice of the COVID restraints on public input conversation, I would ask that the project decision be deferred or that the decision be made to revise the proposed subdivision before approval due to the following reasons. Safety. Public safety for emergencies is severely compromised by providing only one access point for 103 family homes that are planned. The AP regulations that specify subdivision should have two entrances and this is common sense. Similar to two exits required for every home, room in every house. This subdivision will not have even one full access to right and road if only three or four possible traffic turns can be made. There is a second exit set up on substandard Cannon Road for the future, but this type of future contingency is usually not completed due to cost. Think of 103 families or about 300 people affected by flood, fire, or nearby hazard. Of 100 cars in line up, up on two streets to use one exit onto a heavily traveled road. If a right turn out of the entrance is blocked for emergency traffic bus exit left, and we'll have to go over the road restraint or take a right and do a U-turn creating traffic tie-ups. The review by AP is supported by technicality and the regulations that the word shall means no exceptions and should allow for variance, but in only extreme cases. This is not an extreme case, nor can it be supported by any precedent set. See AP regulations on variance. Evidence of variance granted under similar circumstances shall not be considered. Based on the resident's safety, this subdivision should not be built until a second access is available, i.e. cannon is improved. In any event, a better public safety option would be to require emergency vehicle gated access to Cannon Road. Traffic concerns. The traffic study considers two periods, peak AM and peak PM. From 2018, traffic counts increased slightly from 2020, for 2020. Peak AM is 6.30 to 7.30 AM and peak PM is 4.30 to 5.30 PM. Then the extra load due to development is added. 
The study estimated with full turning access there will be 19 additional left turn outs AM and 22 for the PM scenario. This seems to be a low count because at least 50% of 300 plus residents in those homes will make a trip in those hours or about 160 trips. So at left turns are about quarter 160, more like 40 trips. The development cannot be approved if it decreases road traffic one level service grade, six LOS level service from A to F. In left out case, it did degrade Roddy Road, now rated as D for northbound and C for southbound during PM peak to an E level. That's the end of Mr. Tang's three minutes. And yes. Okay, this is a comment from Ms. Angela Stanger that Mr. Fournier just gave me. Uh, her concerns are for Windermere Crossing subdivision. It says the Planning Commission will address the approval of the subdivision Windermere Crossing January 13th. The one entrance exit to the proposed development and the forced right exit onto Roddy Road will cause a massive increase in traffic on the already substandard roads of Cannon and O'Neill. As a resident of O'Neill and employee of the school system, I travel these roads daily to and from East Ascension High School. The amount of traffic during all times, especially peak traffic times, is substantial. The posted speed limits are 25 miles an hour and 35 miles an hour on Cannon and O'Neill, respectively, of which hardly any drivers adhere to. The roads simply cannot handle the increasing amount of traffic, vehicle traffic that the new development and its proposed right turn only out of right. And that's the end of Ms. Stanga's email. Is that all the public comments we have? Uh, I'm not sure. Is that all? Yes, yes it is. That's all the written comments. We have people on hold uh, right now on the phone who would like to give comments. Okay. We right Do we have a, ma a way of monitoring the three minutes? Yes, we're timing that right now. Okay. Please give me a signal, and I would ask anybody on hold who's listening, please limit your comments to three minutes. And uh, if Jerome or Eric, if you give me a signal when the three minutes is up, or if that's that bell I heard is the three minutes, we'll use that. Okay. I, I will signal like this. Okay. okay. We'll hear the first person. Okay. Right now on hold, we'd like to uh, welcome Ms. Kelly Anderson. And this is uh, for the Buzzard Roost project. And she is calling against the, the project, right? So if we could page her in, please. Yes, hello. I have some exhibits that were sent that ho could hopefully be pulled up. Um, regarding different concerns. One being the zoning is an error. There is a section of light industrial that should be on the map, and it's listed as all medium industrial. You can uh, look at exhibit B, and it shows the difference in the two figures. And we need to make sure that this is corrected on the drawing and in the flat, because medium industrial and light industrial have quite different sidelines. So that's very concerning that that gets corrected. Uh, exhibit D also shows the ordinance that was passed and all the documents from that ordinance that was passed that supports uh, the error that I'm trying to correct. Uh, next, we wanted to stay on the record. This can be found in exhibit D as well. The landowner agreed to never connect any roads to Robert Wilson Road. We understand the preliminary plat does not draw anything, but we needed to stay on the record because he agreed to this with us. Uh, next is the buffer zone. This is also in Exhibit D. It was part of the parish ordinance that was passed. The landowner developer agreed to a green space of 100 feet between the industrial property that he's developing and the residences. He has sold residences in the conservation property already and did not put the trees on that property prior to selling it, did not disclose it. Therefore, the green space and the trees he agreed to, which was part of the ordinance, are not there. And we need a buffer between these homes and medium and industry, which will be very nearby. Next is drainage. We urge for curb and gutter. Because of being medium industrial property, there's a great chance that you could have spillage of hazardous material. Curb and gutter would potentially allow more control of 
such bills. Next would be sewage. We are highly against individual septic tanks on this property. That is a parish-wide problem and should not be allowed. That's the end of my comments at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, you Ms. Anderson. The next person on hold is uh, Mr. Norbin, Norbert Latham. Uh, Jerome, Mr. Dumas, you want to be recognized? Unmute yourself. The document that, that she uh, presented, I, uh, are we going to have that as part of the record? Yes, we will. We have that in our possession. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next one. The next caller is Norbert Latham, and he's also calling in reference to Buzzard Roost. Norbert has dropped. He hung up. Okay. The next person we have is Nicole Gray, also speaking about Buzzard Roost. Go ahead, Ms. Gray. Go ahead, Ms. Gray. What was that, John? They're not there. Is Ms. Gray present? Is Ms. Gray present? Okay. The next person we have is Shannon Vickers, also speaking on Buzzard Roost. Is there some problem with the uh, with the phone connection that these people are they just dropping off the line? We're we're checking right now, Mr. Chairman. They're on the line and unmuted. We should be able to hear. We should be able to hear. If you're on the line waiting, please unmute yourself when it's your time to talk. All right, who's the next one? Chrissy Rice, also speaking about Buzzard Roost. Ms. Rice, could you mute your TV, please? And go ahead and wait. Go ahead, Mr. Thank you, Planning Committee members, for allowing me to speak. If you can hear me, thank you. I appreciate the time. Our concerns as we mentioned previously are that, you know, with Buzzard Roost, we, we moved here two years ago and we're unaware with any plans for Buzzard Roost that's adjacent to our property. And we are located on the Y2 lot, which backs up to Buzzard Roost. And we were being told that there's a green space on our property that we pay taxes on and are told that they are, we're restricted from using it how we choose and that there was supposed to be a buffer zone on this green space. And we're concerned because there are no trees on this buffer zone and who is responsible for the trees? Who's going to take care of the trees as they grow and water and do everything that needs to be done with these trees? And if it's not trees, what is gonna be the buffer zone? These are our current concerns, and also the ditch that's also located behind our property is also on our neighbor's property and takes up some of our land. So are they going to have to remove the ditch, relocate the ditch? These are our concerns we have. That we, we, don't, we were not aware of this for buzzard roost. We were unaware of the plans for any green space to build trees on, and there are currently no trees on this green space and we we are against this and I, we want to thank you for for your time i think that was mrs rice was it not okay the next person on hold is marla montoya
Also speaking on buzzard roost. The next person I have is Macy Brack, also speaking on buzzard roost and is against the project. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hello. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Brett. You have three minutes. Hello, I'm not sure if y'all can hear me, but thank you. Okay, I see I'm shaking his head. Okay, thank you for letting us speak on behalf of Budget Roof. I am against the industrial park, and we just moved here about a year ago. Our main concern, our main concern is going to be, of course, everything I stated earlier in support of the other people who spoke, but also the traffic and the through traffic going in and out and the workers and more traffic coming through because I also, I travel for work, so I'm in and out all the time and I see like it gets so backed up and to get out of the subdivision or out of our road, that is also a concern. We also don't want these industrial workers coming in and out of our street. So we don't know what the plan is as far as people driving up and down the street, our road can't take that much traffic. Two cars can't pass at the same time. And in addition to that, the buffer zone, when we moved here a year ago, we were unaware of anything being built behind us. And so to know now that, like I stated before, tax is being paid on our property, and now we are apparently forced to plant trees and everything else, like we just, are totally against this as and our property value will go down tremendously as well. So thank you for letting us speak on behalf of this and we're against it. Thank you, ma'am. The next person we have on hold also speaking against the Buzzard Roost project is Bryant Brumfield. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman, we'll move on to the next. Please do. Um, Please do. The next person we have is Eric Keen, K-E-H-N. This is regarding the Windermere Crossing project. He is against the project. Go ahead, Mr. Keen. Oh, hello. This is Eric Keen. Are y'all calling for me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, go ahead. yes please go ahead. Is anyone there? Yes, we're here. Please go ahead. Can y'all hear me? I'm sorry. I'm delayed on YouTube. Um, I guess yes, I'm going to go ahead and hear me. This is Eric Keen um, calling to um, Windermere Crossing. Uh, many notes were already noted from earlier, so I'm going to try to keep it brief. Uh, first of all, for the Windmere Crossing, the uh, one entrance is against Ascension Parish Subdivision Building Code, and it's nothing like the one exception made previously. Um, the force right turn will not solve the problem. In fact, anyone wanting to move north will be climbing down the standard road uh, to the Cannon O'Neill intersection, which is very tight, and then north on O'Neill with the fraying side, and that tight intersection as well, Black Bayou. Uh, I live in a corner of O'Neill and Black Bayou, and I, I fear for myself and my family would pull up the intersection. It's such a tight turn coming off the 55-mile-per-hour Black Bayou Road. 
that um, the it, it creates a big safety hazard for those coming off quickly trying to get off and then possibly getting hit. Um, the, we witness car uh, accidents there all the time, and at least once a year I have to go out and reshape the ditch and my yard for cars that go off into the yard because of that tight turn. Uh, my children know not to go within 10 feet of that road because of the hazards there, and I just I can't take any risks, and more traffic will certainly make it worse. Uh, I was told at one point several improvements have been made in the past three years on the roads for Roddy, Cannon, O'Neill, and I drive those roads daily. The only thing I see different from three years ago is that trees were cleared and potholes are filled. And I know we're, you know contingencies are a part of subdivision building, but um, I've heard too many bad stories about contingencies being waived in the future and or uh, carried out several years later after the safety hazards have already been present for so long. Um, also, the projection numbers I heard in one of the emails earlier, I also agree. I have a hard time believing the numbers they put for traffic projection numbers. There is no way they're only going to have uh, a handful of extra cars during peak times with that many houses in that area. Uh, and finally, my number five, I looked at the property and elevation map, and that whole area is the same elevation as family land nearby there, and I have personally witnessed that black bayou overflowing water into that area several times uh, throughout the year, and it even comes close to property with existing homes on it. If we eliminate that retention area, it's most assuredly going to displace that water into the homes that already exist, and, uh, and that is a huge, we really need to do something to prevent that before we eliminate that area. Thank you very much for your time and listening. The next person I have is, on here is Debbie Satoon. She also sent in an email uh, that was read into the record. Mr. Chairman, I'll de defer to you as to whether you would like to listen to Ms. Satoon. Well, our policy is to have uh, to get one shot with three minutes. If she sent the email in, then I think she's had her, her say. If it's on the same issue, if it's a different issue, then um, certainly, we can we let her be heard on that. But um, I don't think that we've ever allowed somebody to speak more than once on the same issue. If we were doing live, she would get one three minute time period. So um, okay. Thank I'm you. not going to hear any more of that. We already heard okay. it. The next person then on the on the list is Rebecca Mabel. She is speaking against the Windermere Crossing project. Go ahead, Ms. Mabel. Hello? Yes, please proceed, Ms. Mabel. Um, you read my email, so I think I had my three minutes, but... Wait, did we get an my error from her too? I'm against the we did, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. My error, I did not recognize yeah. that ahead of time. All right. Yeah. If we, if we had the email, same rule applies. Okay. And the last person we have who's called in is Susan Jordan. She's talking about the, she is against the Windermere Crossing project. Go ahead, Ms. Jordan. Is she there? Is she there? We, I have no, no, it appears not. Oh, right. Any more, any more callers? You can't hear when they call. Me. No, you can't at all. You hung up on me because I didn't even know. Yeah. Well, um, I can't hear the names and one guy. We he have somebody talking, talking right there. Who is that? You know, he, he just talked and I heard him on the YouTube Jordan, in the other here? room. So he just started talking. I'm, I'm hoping. Somebody, you're on the line. If you would like your three minutes, now is the time to get it. 
Miss Jordan, are you able to hear us? <clears throat> If you're watching this on YouTube, you need to mute your YouTube. Is she on the line? She is still on the line, but we're not hearing her. All right, can we try and get her over and get move on? I don't think they could come on. We're checking with the IT department. They're in another room. No other callers. There are no other callers, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any more public comments? Uh, I only have one, Mr. Chairman. I have an email from Mr. T. Banker, and he says, I am against it. And that's referencing the Windermere project. Okay. Yes, because that's yeah, Tim Banker, he lives on uh, Variety, so that's what that is. Okay. Any other public comments? No. All right, we will move on then to the engineering staff report. Yeah, thank you. No report this evening. All right. Actually, I went out of order accidentally. Um, we should have done the subdivision staff report, Mr. Poche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In your package, you should have this month's subdivision status report. As always, any changes are noted with asterisk. If there are any questions, I will certainly entertain them. Any questions, please raise your hand. All right, going once, going twice. All right, we did the engineering staff report. There's no report. There's item number 10 is a min is a minutes approve a motion to approve or deny the minutes and written decisions of the December 9th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. I have a so motion by Mr. Furman, second by Mr. Dumas. All in favor? Please raise your hand. Put it in front of the camera. Any imposed? I don't see any. Motion carries. Item number 11 is the consent agenda. 11A is the affidavit of mortgage declaration uh, for Pedro and Maria Alfaro, lot 11, 6231 Highway 44 in Gonzales. Item 11B is the affidavit of mortgage declaration for Kristen Bro, lot 1A1, 1233, or 12233 George Lambert Road in Santa Ma. Item number 11C is an affidavit of mortgage declaration for Timothy N. Taylor. Lot B1, 2A1, 8381 Paul Road in Santa Ma. And item number 11D is a final plat approval for Pelican Crossing, fifth filing by Quality Engineering and Surveying LLC in Council District 2. Do I have a motion? Motion by Mr. Furman, second by Mr. Chasson. All in favor, please raise your hand. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I just have a quick question of staff on, on the last item. Um, is the last comment on the ERA later resolved and have all the HOA matters that, that were discussed or have they been addressed? Mr. Dumas, uh, uh, Commissioner Dumas, are you referring to the final plat approval for Pelican Crossing? Yes, sir. Okay, I, I couldn't hear, quite hear the question. I have, you know, there's, a, there's an open comment on the ERA letter, and then there's also the, all the HOA matters. There were extensive meetings. Have all of those been addressed? Oh, yes, all of them have been addressed. They have been addressed. Awesome, thank you. Just wanted to confirm it for the benefit of the public. All right, I'm all good. in favor, please raise your hand. Put it in front of the camera so I can see. Looks like everybody's in favor, none opposed. The consent agenda passes. All right, item number 12 is public hearing or to approve or deny the following preliminary plats. Item number 12A is Claire Court by McGlynn Taylor and Council District 8. Um, do we have somebody calling in from McGlynn Taylor on this subdivision? Staff, do we have somebody calling in from McGlynn Taylor? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Poignier just went out to get him. Okay. I assume it's Miss Jackson. 
They're coming right now, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in front of you have the applicant and his representative for the Claire, um, okay. Claire subdivision, and uh, they're ready to make a presentation to you, right? Okay. okay. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? I can, yes. I can, yes. Okay. Sure. Here we go. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Jimmy Percy on behalf of the applicant here tonight. We have representatives with me of the engineering firm as well as traffic engineering in case there are any questions on technical issues that the commission might have. Just a couple of preliminary comments. Clare Court is a 37 lot development proposed to the north of Cornerview Road, Louisiana Highway 429. All comments of the staff have been addressed. Uh, you have seen the engineering report. You've seen the various applicants' presentations. There is only one waiver that is being requested, and that is that the sidewalk elevation be allowed to be included within the right-of-way, the street right-of-way. That actually was suggested by a member of the staff it would be required and it is, as my understanding goes, routine, routinely granted in applications of this sort. That is the only waiver of any requirement of the parish with regard to this particular development. The lots are 60 and 70 foot frontage. And again, it's a 37 foot development. Um, with regard to drainage very quickly, always an important issue. The development will actually improve the current runoff at the site. There is a retention pond at the back of the development, which is to the south of Bayou Goudin. Then there is the bayou, but this tract goes beyond the bayou to the north, and there is a detention area to the north of that, as well as another area that will be used for runoff in that direction. In addition to that, the development will actually widen Bayou Goudin at this location, which will improve drainage and runoff, not just on this site, but elsewhere in the general vicinity. With regard to the density, this lot meets all elements of the zoning code. And in fact, the zoning would allow for a density of, for example, almost three lots per acre, the proposed density of this particular development will be one and a half, approximately one and a half lots per acre. One half of the density permitted by the zoning for this tract. With regard to traffic, again, another issue that we know is very important to the commission and to the parish. Um, members of this commission may recall that there was a development that was proposed for this same tract a little more than a year ago, it was called Evelyn Estates. That development, at the time a traffic study was done for that development, was a development proposed to be 55 lots. As I've indicated a couple of times already, this development only proposes 37 lots for this. As you can imagine, that dramatically changes the traffic study. Because this development that's before you tonight reduces the number of lots below 40, 37 lots, there is no requirement in its traffic study for any consideration of nearby intersections. However, you already have before you and the staff has referred to the traffic study for the 55 lot development that was previously proposed. So I wanna make very, very clear, there is no attempt 
to in any way change anything, but we need to point out the dramatic reduction in lots, which obviously dramatically reduces the trips to and from this particular development. The traffic study for this development says minimal impact on traffic on Cornerview Road. I might also mention that one of the nearby intersections that was looked at in the previous traffic study for the development of 55 lots was the Highway 73 Cornerview intersection. You will also recall that at that time, one of the proposals for that intersection was that a traffic light be installed. Well, a traffic light has in fact been installed at that location. So the bottom line is this particular development meets all elements of the parish policies, regulations, with the sole exception of the waiver that is requested for the sidewalk, and as I've indicated, and will be indicated or would be indicated by the staff, which is routinely granted. Uh, the landowners, a representative of the landowner will be here to speak tonight. The developer of this tract is H1 Associates. One of the principals of H1 Associates is Jeff Valley, longtime resident of Ascension Parish, family lives here, uh, has the best interests of the parish at heart, wants to do a development that meets all of the policies, rules, regulations, and ordinances of the parish. And that's what we bring before you here tonight. We're happy to answer any questions that the commission might have. And again, I have technical representation here this evening, engineering as well as traffic engineering on any particular technical issues that you may raise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Percy. Uh, staff, um, I'll just ask you, does uh, both the engineering standpoint and uh, planning staff, does this meet all the uh, engineering guidelines and court ordinances and the subdivision guidelines and ordinances yes it does mr chairman all right uh, yeah, anybody have now. a question a comment for mr percy or any of the other representatives here or a motion mr chasson so ju just to make sure i'm clear so the the tables with regards to the traffic analysis that's in the letter from CSR. Those were actually not done for this Claire Court subdivision. Those were the ones done for Evelyn Estates. That so is the, correct. So the conclusion about needing a whether it's a roundabout or whatever it is it talks about as far as the mitigation here, that was due to a subdivision that had for, for the subdivision that had more lots with more trips. Well, that that is correct. I want to be very, very careful when I tell you, and I want to make sure that the commission understands, yes, in answer to your specific question, that is correct. Those tables were all done at those intersections with the development as proposed with 55 lots. Uh, you may also recall that shortly before the previous meeting on that prior development, the developer proposed to drop the number of lots in that development to 43. However, there was not an additional traffic study done, so that is correct. That previous traffic study was done when that was proposed for 55 lots. But I also want to make sure that what's clear is what those tables are reflecting is what you see at those intersections. And a projection of, if you will, what impact there might be with the development of 55 lots. What the traffic study in this instance says is traffic on quarter view, which ultimately may flow in either direction to those intersections, the traffic impact on corner view is minimal. And I, I asked the engineer, and he's here tonight, does that mean negligible? Yes. Minuscule? Yes. Uh, hardly or barely noticeable? Yes. So the bottom line is with 37 lots, the projected impact under the traffic study is negligible and minuscule. Uh, I'd like uh, Mr. John Chirot, engineer, to be able to see him. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, are you able to hear, hear me from here? Okay. Uh, 
Mr. Chasson, the, as we're well aware, the traffic policy, the ERA is allowed to decide what threshold study to decide on. The projected counts is the primary governing decision. However, so even though this project was less than the 40, you would typically you'd have to look at the intersections. We knew that we already had available information to talk about the existing condition. So these tables are applicable and most useful to analyze what is the existing condition of these offsite intersections. So the portions that talk about build, that the build part is based on 55 lots, but these tables are useful to look at what is the existing performance before anybody adds any trips at all. So we have the available information, so that's why it's included in this report and it's for the planning commission to such how or if they would want to use that, that information. So I didn't want someone to think that it came from a previous study, therefore everything on those tables are no good. The existing condition we put on those tables is what is the reason why we have it in this, uh, this report. And, and with all respect, Mr. Chesson, that's why I brought it up initially, so that you knew everything that's on the table before you. Right. Any other? You muted the line, Matt. We can't hear you. Any other questions, comments, or motion? Somebody want to make a motion? Well, I just have one quick question with the uh, the sewage. Will that be tying into the uh, eventual parish, or is that going to be a standalone? Um, under the current configuration of the subdivision, it's going to be a standalone system. Um, if there's a, if there's a requirement, there's a trunk line available in the future. The the project will very likely tie into that future line. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Furman, Mr. Furman, you raise your hand also. And Mr. Mr. Furman first, or Mr. Dubas. Uh, yeah, real quick, I got a question for for uh, for staff. Um, if we allow the sewer treatment plant to be at the rear of the subdivision, at some time that its front line comes in, who's going to be responsible for the forces all the way from the back? Um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Commissioner uh, Dumas, I'll, I'll let the engineer re review that, but typically we're, we're allowing gravity flow down to, down to sewer plants. Um, and this would probably be the most uh, reasonable configuration of the sewer. But uh, Mr. Craig, can you address that, please? Yeah. yeah. If you, I, I'm not sure I call the, the entirety of the question. Um, so the question is who would be responsible for making yeah, so the, the question is, you're putting, you're putting a sewer treatment plant at the rear of these of this cul-de-sac, so it's going to be gravity flow all the way to that. But sometimes there's a trunk line that the parish or somebody will build on, on corner view that will be required to connect to it. Who's going to connect that? Who's going to build the force main that's going to go from the, from the new pump pump? All the way to the to the to the sewer treatment line at the street. I mean, uh, you know, so uh, right now we're going to gravity to the rear and you know pump at that location into that proposed treatment plant. But at at some time, if there's a trunk line on a corner view, then uh, that lift li station, wherever it's located, and you know the development of the plans, you know. The force main can be rerouted to that trunk line if it's ever installed. Right, but it's going to be costly to go to go what uh, the distance all the way to the rear to to connect that. You know, tear down the street or whatever. You know, it's going to be expensive. Someone's going to have to pay for that. I guess what I'm getting at is, is that I would I would rather see through the solar lift station in front of the rear so that the future is somebody that can have but not, not the engineer the review agency, Sean, would like to make a comment on that. Yeah. 
Um, should there should there be a trunk line on corner view or anywhere in the area? Whoever is designing consolidating these systems, they would need to consider consolidating the adjacent subdivision to the left. There is possibilities that it actually makes more sense to actually send this treatment plant, turn it to a pump station, and pump it into the adjacent uh, sanitary sewer system with the subdivision nearby. So in the pre-act meeting, we actually reviewed this with the utility department. This was the best location for the temporary situation and also the possibility you know, that they could connect the adjacent subdivision okay. uh, to consolidate more than one treatment plant. I just wanted to make sure that we, we thought about it. That's all. Thank you. Yes, it was thought. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I, just something very quick. Um, the landowner is here, representative of landowner, to speak in favor. And I just wanted to ask the indulgence of the commission if the landowner could just make some very brief comments. Okay. Good evening. My name is Kelly Orso. I represent the owners. Uh, this property has been in our family for a little over 90 years. All of the current owners uh, grew up on this property. But as we've established our homes elsewhere in the parish, we came to the decision it was time to part with it. Um, as been stated previously, uh, the proposed development falls well within the zoning guidelines. The, uh, as stated, the lot density is half of is allowed under the zoning. Uh, developer Mr. Valley has addressed the previous comment, the comments of the previous plan, and he's reduced the lot number in order to address those issues, particularly the traffic issue. Uh, we have uh, complied with all the guidelines. We have, we're addressing the previous concerns, and we're working within the rules. So we uh, sincerely ask for approval of the project. Thank you for your time. Okay, Mr. Furman, you had raised your hand previously. Yes, I was making a motion to approve the project. All right, we got a motion to approve by Mr. Furman. Do I have a second? A second by Mr. Dumas. All in favor? Please raise your hand. Mr. Carmich, are you raising your hand or not? Okay. Uh, all opposed? All right, so. Uh, O'Neill, since we did a, a signal vote, do we have to do a, a voice vote for opposition here? Not if you're able to record the votes. All right, so I have uh, I have in favor Mr. Chasson, Mr. Dumas, Mr. Hodgson, and Mr. Furman in the chair. Uh, in opposition, Mr. Carmouche. So that would be uh, five to one. The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman and members of the commission. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number 12B is buzzard roost. Um, and obviously we heard a lot of opposition uh, to buzzard roost in the public comment section. Uh, Mr. Cameron, Mr. do we have uh, buzzard roost people here? Yes, we do. Can you give me a minute to assemble everybody for that? Thank you. Yes. Matt, I'm going to take a bio break, so I'll be right back. Yeah, and I, I was muted, but if you need a break, now's a good time to take one. Good evening. Sorry about the delay. Getting us all routed in here. Hold on, Mr. Murphy. I'm not sure everybody's um, 
ready yet. Let me just make sure. All right, we're all good. We're all good. But I hope that we're not all back yet. I don't think we're all I think we're all back. So, uh, Mr. Murphy, floor is yours. I assume that's you. You look that way. You look much thinner from far away. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's how we need to do it every time, maybe. Uh, like I said last time, it's a pleasure to see y'all again. I wish it was in person, but understand the circumstances where we're at tonight. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about uh, Buzzard Roost Industrial Park. Uh, this is this is a a phase project with a, uh, a a very very large project actually and and looking at the whole picture and looking at the big picture on what this project is is part of uh, we've been working on this for a number of years and have been meeting with staff uh, and meeting with representatives of Ascension Parish DOTD uh, so forth for many months and. Uh, this project, it, we came before y'all at some time back and changed the zoning from this uh, from this area from conservation to light and medium industrial, and this is just the next step as part of that overall plan. Uh, we have tonight. We, we've met with DOTD. We are look, using the existing industrial drive that leaves Highway 30 and tying to it. And uh, these lots, of course, are zone uh, industrial. They're over all over one acre in size, as well as meeting all of the criteria uh, for a industrial type park. When I say that this is part of a bigger uh, project or a bigger uh, development in this area, if anyone was able to watch the transportation uh, committee meeting on Monday night, DOTD and staff did a presentation at, uh, concerning the proposed interchange at Corner View, uh, Corner View and Interstate 10. And part of that, uh, interchange includes a corridor that extends down from corner view goes along the eastern property line of this larger piece of property goes across robert wilson road and ties into highway 30 with a major possible roundabout intersection uh, this particular first phase of industrial park takes all of that into account as far as the location on the property uh, future possible connections in order to make that tie-in and uh, basically part of figuring out where the future access needs to be. Uh, from my understanding, Ascension Parish has put in this part of the portion of this project in the MOVE Ascension uh, program and to help expedite uh, the first portion off of Highway 30 getting constructed, designed, and so forth. So we're here tonight asking for, asking for approval on this first phase. This will be the only phase that we bring before you without doing a major uh, either traffic study of the region uh, when dealing with DOTD, that was one of their requirements, or once the corridor is put in and doing a study based on that corridor and so forth. So again, this is a standalone project as part of the larger project, larger development. We're asking tonight for your approval for this phase one. Mr. 
staff, can you give us uh, a rundown on the engineering side and the ordinance side? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll start off by addressing some of the uh, comments that uh, Mr. Murphy did uh, in relationship to the larger picture. Um, yes, uh, the parish has been in conversations with DOTD for some time now, about a quarter that's going to take us from Highway 30 um, and it would traverse through this property and go up to what they're contemplating as a new interchange at I-10 near, near the location of Corner View. All right. We've been discussing that with DOTD. We've been having meetings with them for a couple of years now. Um, this, this project, as uh, Mr. Murphy said, would tie into that. Uh, as part of that corridor analysis and corridor planned, uh, planned corridor, they're also look, looking at an east-west connection that would go from the new road all the way to 73. And this, prop, this project right now, as they have it planned, would connect into that east-west corridor, all right? So it's one thing that we're, we're trying to look at. One thing that we'd like to do is look at an overall picture of this project and get an analysis of the overall configuration as the, you know, from a traffic standpoint and a street network standpoint as to how that's all gonna tie in, all right? So that's one of the things that we've been, we've been talking about. Uh, we've been also communicating with the landowner of the property and, um, and looking at how we can acquire a right of way to help build that and get some assistance from him to build a portion of that corridor. And uh, that's been a, an ongoing communication. Uh, as Mr. Murphy said, um, this particular project can kind of stand on its own because it's got, but it does have a connection to a road that the parish is considering. Um, I wouldn't call it inadequate or, or substandard, but it's certainly not a, an ideal road that would connect into this, and that is Industrial Plex Avenue, right? So uh, with that said, I, I know that Mr. Chiro has some comments too that he'd like to make on this project, all right? So. Uh, actually, I believe, you know, most of my comments, I believe they're adequately addressed in our review letter. Uh, so maybe it's the time if you have some specific questions, any of those items, I can address those. But uh, like I said, I, I think it's summarized uh, Officially, in my letter. All right, um, Mr. Murphy, could you address some of the concerns raised by some of the residents, uh, particularly Miss Anderson, and I think there was another one, Miss Wright Rice, who um, were concerned about the buffer zone and the green space that has been sold off and that the zoning map is not accurate in our package. Uh, I can Hang on, sir. Ms. Mr. Chairman, I could address the zoning map issue. Okay. Um, that, has been, that has been corrected. It was an error on our, on our um, the, the zoning map was approved by the zoning commission and, and subsequently by the council. And um, when we placed it on the GIS system, it was inaccurately placed there. We have since corrected that error, right? So that, that the zoning issue has been taken care of, right? Okay. okay. As, as far as the buffer, uh, as I understand it, I was part of that rezoning. These lots that were along Robert Wilson Road were at one time, I think uh, 300 feet, I'm not sure the exact distance. And the lots actually were added uh, another 100 feet to those lots in order to pull the industrial side away from uh, away from Robert Wilson Road. The reason that was done, we never, from my understanding, we never said anything about trees, but the green space, we did leave that because if we had a, a, stri a strict green buffer, there was nobody to maintain that. So those were added to those lots as as part of a buffer of residential to the industrial from the people that live on Robert Wilson Road. Uh, so that's where the 100 foot buffer is. It's actually in those residential lots. Any other questions, Mr. Dumas? Uh, 
So what you're telling me is that zone C, the area in blue on this map, those are the residential lots that you've added that buffer to make it deep enough, right? Yes. Those lots are already in existence? Those lots, yes. Okay, I, I think in the in the interest of clarity, we need to make sure that this is clearly designated as as whatever that zoning is and that the residential lots and not part of the industrial park or the proposed industrial development. All right, any other questions and or comments? Mr. Carmish. Yes, so I'm looking at the traffic impact study and I see some legs on the two lane high already at uh, level of service E. And down further in the engineering notes, um, it says traffic study shows that LA 30 is worse than it be. Additional lanes at LA 30 has been identified as the solution to improve the level of service to a D or better. Is, is there any I mean, I, typically, we see a build and then, and then this condition in there also with improvement. But I don't see that in these tables where that improvement is. I just see existing. You know, Member Dakalala, a traffic engineer, and address that. You understand what he's trying to add, though? He's saying in the roadway segment level of service uh, shows E, and we have identified four-lane LA 30 as bringing it up to D. Is that what you're asking about? Yes, that's what I was looking for. It's basically an extension of that table that would show the build of these lanes that, that would indicate that increase in, uh, to level of service of D, because I don't see this increase, just the statement below. I don't see the traffic impact analysis that would indicate that. Yeah, I'll answer that. Yeah. I'm I apologize. They, this table it does not include what the level service would be with proposed improvements. Basically, they concluded that the only improvements that you can do to improve it to an E would be to widen, add additional lanes to each direction on the Highway 30. And so it was just a statement saying that's what's needed to make it better, but it wasn't actually ran as a, it's a very difficult analysis to run, but basically it is concluded additional lanes on Highway 30 would be needed. They noted the proposed interchange improvements at 30, so those improvements would be sufficient to make it better than a D, but it's just not reflected in this table of what the actual number would be. That's a, beyond the scope of what this traffic study should be is, is being proposed by others. Mr. Mr. Dumas, you have a question? Uh, no, I actually, do, do we need to go to public or, or are we ready for a motion? Well, I think Mr. Chasson has a question. Okay. What about the sewer? You've got in bold and underlined on here, there shall be no sewer discharge to ditches within the public right of way. And I know there was some discussion about uh, curb and gutter versus the open ditches. How does the plan that we're being asked to approve, what is actually in the plan and what is the requirement of the parish preference there? So it's my understanding, and Jerome can answer this as good as, as me, but based on this zoning and the fact that we have one acre lots, by the code, we don't need a community sewer plant. However, you can, as a parish, restrict sewer going into the front ditches. So if we did individual sewer plants, we would have to find another discharge location. Uh, we have been in communication with several uh, uh, 
with private sewer, uh, private sewer entities to come in and provide community sewer, and that's what we're working on now, but it is not technically a requirement. Uh, I can uh, fill in the blanks on that as well. Is that um, it's correct what Derek said is that because there are one acre and larger lots, they're not by code required to put in a centralized sewer plant. Um, but we've been in discussion with the developer and the parish administration would be willing to move to the council to provide a waiver, which is required under a sewer ordinance, to allow them to go to a third party entity to uh, provide sewer. Uh, they're pursuing that on their end. It would take a waiver, as I said, by the, uh, by the parish council to, to effectuate that, and we would be willing to pursue that. We, uh, the goal of the parish has been, you know, and, and especially under the new administration, is that we're trying to clean up the ditches of the parish. And we're trying to get raw sewage, not raw sewage, but, but discharge from small package plants out of the local ditches. And so the developer is willing to work with us on that, and uh, we're willing to work with him. Especially in this area, with as much development as coming up in this area, uh, of course, we would want, uh, we're working with that third party in order to provide uh, sewers by the uh, next door to this particular project this commission has approved other industrial parks open ditch same road sections uh larger lots one acre and above and they didn't have sewer there uh these are pretty recent approvals it's the same same kind of uh our deal here the fact the administration has asked us to look into that we've agreed and we've also uh looking at moving forward with the waiver at the council level and seeing uh trying to get a community sewer put in place is that something that should be re resolved before we vote on this? That way, if we make sure there's an agreement in place and we can vote and make sure that we have the actual agreement as opposed to, I don't know if that we're voting on something with the contingency and then the contingency gets weighed later because it can't be met or parish can't come to an agreement. I uh, see we're in here, the, the staff preference under recommendations is to delay the decision on this until we can look at the entire um, development. And I believe Mr. Murphy stated it's a standalone project as part of a larger project. It's kind of one or the other, right? It's either a standalone project or it's part of a larger project. And I agree with the, the parish's um, position that we really need to look at the entire, it's such a large and complex project in an area where there's a lot going on, especially with the traffic corridor and the parish changing its position on sewer, that we probably need to look at the entire development at once and not look at it piecemeal. Well, and th some of those discussions were actually had uh, as late as today. And, uh, you know, we did have some meetings and so forth. The, the issue here is, is that this particular development does not affect the overall use of corridor for this entire region. Meets the code, we've looked at everything. It does meet the code for, for as it stands today. It's a standalone in the fact that it does meet the code. And that's why we brought it forward. We, the developer for this piece of property wants to go ahead and, and use, uh, uh, develop this first piece while the state, the parish, and him figure out the corridor. We don't know if it's going to be next next month, next year, but let him go ahead and put together a project, put in place, start construction on something that is not going to prohibit, change, or interfere with the overall plan of this area. When we started looking at what we want to do in the rest of the project and on the rest of the vacant property, well, that depends on what the state and the parish is ultimately going to do along with that this you know as part of this corridor enhancement you know this developer property owner is going to be required or requested or asked to come in and donate sell be a part of a large set of corridors uh that's going to be part of the the regional solution so he's willing to sit down and work outside of this the other thing is, is it's it would be also a little different if this portion of the of the project was not uh bordered by pipelines power lines things like that so what happens is it sets a hard uh a feature land feature geographical feature that is a break 
it made sense to go in and get this in place and, and make sure from a regional standpoint that it does not interfere in what all the public entities are trying to do. Well, I'm gonna find my camera and wave my hand. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still, and then on the buffer issue, I, I'm pretty sure and I, that the, as Ms. Anderson indicated, and I'm trying to look through her stuff, maybe Jerome, I don't know if you've got the exhibits, didn't one of the exhibits include a copy of the ordinance where they had indicated they were gonna include the trees as part of the buffer, and then they wound up selling the, the land off without the trees anyway? Uh, do you have her exhibits in front of you? Uh, Let's see if I can find that. Um, I'm looking at it. She's got um, the trees and greenery along the entire green space, one row of slash pines planted every 25 feet. Um, something by wax burners, two rows of live oaks two to three uh which is a cow fifty feet was that not done as part of the buffer and was it supposed to be done as part of the buffer yeah i'm trying to find the uh the email that the, the it looks like it's on her exhibit d page Maybe four, maybe four, or, or I don't know, my computer's slow. Okay. I'm not sure what page it is, but it looks like there's some oh, there documents. Yeah. It's attached as yeah. part of an ordinance. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty specific about trees being included. Types of trees. That was an agreement that they made with the developer. I, I am Mr. Lance Brock, our zoning official in here who can address that. Right? And let's remember that there was an agreement between the property owners and and the um, and the developer when that rezone occurred that was not part of any action of the parish, right? So that was kind of a private agreement that he had with the, with the landowners, right, along that area. So so Jerome, I just need to know what were what were the what were the parish agreements? Just the buffer? Did the parish agreement include trees or no trees? Neither. No, the, the parish did not. That was an agreement, as I said, between the developer and the landowners along that area of Robert Wilson Road. But the rezoning ordinance had the buffer there, correct? No, it had, it had a strip of conservation. Just had a strip of conservation. Conservation strip that divided the industrial oh, portion right. with, the, with the residential area. All right. That, I, okay, I remember now. It just strictly re retained that conservation zoning. Correct. Yes, and that conservation zoning will remain. So the document with the signatures: uh, Travis Turner, Dwight Poyer, Brady Malasson. That's not an actual part of the ordinance and that's something else that is no. that seems to be a, a document completely outside of the parish right okay okay so he violated or not violated but broke the agreement he entered into with the the homeowners with regards to what was going to be included in the in that property so but that's not yeah. under our purview All right. All right. All right. Anybody else? Mr. Dumas? I, I'm ready to make a motion. To make a motion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve subject to a, a number of conditions. Of One of them is to that that zone C area that's still in the conservation zone needs to be boldly labeled as so, as conservation. I don't particularly need the lots to be shown. I just think it needs to be boldly labeled as conservation zoning. So it's clear that that's what it is. Um, 
I, I think that yeah. Industrial Plex Avenue mm -hmm. is a is, is substandard, so this development is going to be done. So my motion includes a condition that Industrial Plex is going to be a temporary access until other means of ingress and egress are, are in place, at which time uh, that access has to be severed. Um, they have to complete a conceptual master plan for the overall circulation of the, of the total parcel of land prior to uh, final plat approval of this particular area. Uh, I'm not sure if this, if this is a waiver that I don't want to approve, but I, I don't want any, I don't need ditches. I think they need to have curb and gutter and they need to have a sewer treatment facility and they should, and they should encourage them to go get the waiver from the Paris Council so that they can enter into a private agreement with a private company. And they need the alleys along the rear of these industrial parcels so to enhance circulation. So I've got a motion by Mr. Dumas. We have a second on that. Any second on Mr. Dumas's motion? All right, seeing no second, I guess the motion dies. Any other alternative motion? My motion not clear. Somebody have a question about my motion? So, Neil, what happens if we don't have a motion? You're muted, O'Neill. An action has to be taken within 60 days of submit, Lawrence, or it's deemed approved. Yes, Mr. Carmen. Question. Sorry, I apologize for before. I lost complete internet connection. Um, if we can just briefly touch on the level of service E that's improved to D with additional lanes, I missed the entire engineer uh, statement. Wait, what's he want? He missed a second. All right, I'm going to, uh, Mr. Conference, can you hear me now? Okay. The proposed solution to improve uh, to a level of service better than a D would need to widen Highway 30 in both directions. Uh, that was just a statement made by the traffic engineer, which is consistent with the corridor improvements. So uh, there is no analysis done to say exactly what it would be other than just stating it would be the solution to make it better than a D uh, uh, for that particular project. And also be mindful that there are proposed we also proposed interchange improvements also at this intersection, which is also um, there to help improve that entire corridor. So it was beyond the scope of this traffic engineer to tell us exactly uh, how well those improvements would be. They just made a statement that is anticipated to be better than a D, which is typical of DOTD. They're not going to approach a project that would not uh, provide results you know, much better than existing condition. Okay. If I understand correctly, there's no analysis, to, analysis that supports an increase to the level of service D. There's just a statement from an engineer. There's no analysis included in this study. That, that analysis has been done by others by oh, saying okay. that an additional lane in each direction would be the solution. And then the statement above that, 
It says the ERA has not been presented a traffic solution that addresses most of the limitations regarding use of the integrated lakes and traffic solution. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, it doesn't give, make a lot of sense just with that statement. Yes, the, at the time this letter was written, the only connection that has been presented in a traffic study or in a set of plans is that connection to industrial flex. Throughout this meeting, you have heard from Mr. Jerome and Mr. Murphy that they have, there's been discussions about adding an additional road segment that would be a part of the ultimate solution which is, I believe, that was a part of Mr. Dumas's uh, uh, proposed uh, losing <laughs> his proposal was industrials just to be always be treated as temporary, with the future connection on the ultimate route. So I didn't want that imply that that information been to me and I reviewed it and considered part of the analysis. But that doesn't imply that that's a false or not a reasonable solution. It just hasn't been presented to us to comment on. Yes, and we're we're fully aware that industrial flex was going to be temporary. We once we got into this corridor and saw what we're going to be putting east, west, north, south. We definitely want to make sure that we are attached to those corridors. This is a temporary solution that will be changed at some point. I'm simply trying to tie it into a condition of approval, so make sure that we capture it and monitor it. We still have a motion. Do we have a second on the motion? Motion to approve with conditions that Mr. Doom has set forth. Chairman, I guess I feel that this uh, this project probably needs to be um, picked up at a later meeting based on recommendations from staff. Uh, like there's some uh, suggestions in, in uh, staff's recommendations, uh, and, and they're suggesting perhaps uh, bring it up at a, at a later meeting after the uh, the concerns are addressed. So I don't know if you want that in the form of a motion or just. A, just a comment. Well, I think, uh, I mean, if it's going to be pulled, and O'Neill can correct me if I'm wrong, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. But I don't think we can move to pull it and wait. We either got to take an action up or down on it. Is that correct, O'Neill? That's correct, or it's, or it's deemed approved. If it's not, once it's submitted in 60 days, you have to act on it. So unless the developer is willing to withdraw to a later motion or to a later date, we have to give a vote one way or the other, or it gets approved without any conditions on it, just as it's been submitted. Yes, Mr. Carmich. So again, traffic impact study table four. Um, I, I see that this, am I seeing that right? That there are reductions in level of service? Everybody on the echo, can, can we get everybody to move? Feedback. Get your line. Go ahead, Mr. Carmouche. So I'm trying, I can't tell if the chart is just inverted a little bit and going left to right rather than up and down like it's typically done. So it's a little bit confusing if I look up and up to down. I'm just trying to determine if there's a reduction in level of service there. No, they're looking at the council meeting packet from December 21 of 2017, and which is where the, order, the zoning change was affected and I'm seeing that letter or that 
agreement, which includes the trees in the buffer zone, is lit, is in there as part of the packet, as part of the, um, I guess, part of the ordinance. So I guess that's where I'm confused because and certainly the residents believe that those trees were supposed to be there as part of the buffer. And this document that was submitted to us certainly appears in the packet behind that ordinance. And so I'm just trying to get clarification as to what no, that might have been in the minutes. I'm sorry, Aaron. It may have been a minute, but remember that we cannot put any conditions on any rezoning. So that's just some agreement that, that they did with the landowners. That has nothing to do with the package. We either rezone it or we don't rezone it. It was placed in the package as a point of reference and, and for information purposes. But the, the, the council and the parish cannot put conditions on rezoning. And that's a condition that they placed on there. So the options today are either we approve, we deny, or the applicant withdraw at the current time to allow the, the, the full plan to be reviewed later. If we deny, what's the the length of time before they can come back with the with the seek reapproval? Well, they get to appeal to the parish council, and the parish right. council then can overturn us based on the submission that's presented to us. The motion currently made by Mr. Dumas has several specific conditions related to it, which if we do not approve those or deny it on that, then that's the council is not as the appellate board is not bound by that and they can approve it as is. And the parish council add their own conditions. Well, I think they'll take it up as an appeal. I don't know what the standard is on appeal, but they, the parish council abolished, abolished. If we vote to approve it, there's no appeal from it. If we vote to deny, it can be appealed. What used to be the appeal board, the parish council has taken over the role of the appeal board. And this, what's the staff? What's the last? I think the staff already said it within minutes. What's the ultimate staff recommendation? The staff is not recommending approval or denial. What the staff has done is tell you whether it meets the code or does not meet the code. And we we can make certain recommendations as to what we'd like to include in any motion that might be uh, adopted or, or any motion to approve the project. But you know, in terms of whether we're going to tell you it should be or should not be approved, that's that's a, uh, a decision of the commission. All right, Mr. Carmich, you had your hand up first, and Mr. Dumas. Yes. Uh, so underneath, we have the basically two stipulations or two waivers already, and so we're waiving an ordinance. Is that is that the case here? We're, no, we're I think Mr. Waiver. Dumas did not, and you can correct me, Julio, if I'm wrong, but. Uh, one of the waivers was for an open uh, ditch, and your specific uh, condition was, was curbing gutter, correct? That is correct. Prohibit open ditches, correct. That was a condition of the motion to approve that uh, Julio made. I don't know what the other, I don't remember what the other uh, request for a variance was. The rear alleys, and I think uh, Mr. Dumas made that stipulation as well of their approval. Yeah. So the con the conditions that Julio put on it were not to grant those variances. So we have a motion to move forward with the motion. We need a second to vote. What can, if can Julio? Has an can you read the motion? We can. We'll take that. Yes, Mr. Chasson. Can, can Julio restate? the motion, what exactly is and is not included in the motion? Be happy to. So my my condition specifically said that they could not have open ditches, they had to do curb and gutter, that they had to uh, put the put the, the uh, alleys and that they had to be part of the 
uh, development plan, the, the construction drawings for the subdivision, and they have to be in as part of the improvements. Uh, the access to access to Industrial Plex Avenue had to be temporary, and at such time as the other roads were available, that access had to be severed. And last but not least, that that zone C on the map, which is the conservation area, needed to be boldly labeled as conservation, not a part of the industrial development. And on the sewer part, I specifically said that they would, they, they should encourage them to go to the council for the waiver so they could negotiate with a private company. Those are my conditions. Mr. Chasson. I'll make a substitute motion to take Julio's motion, but to add to it items three and four from the staff's recommended conditions so that it has all of Julio's conditions plus conditions three and four, which is the applicant provide the transportation plan for the streets within the entire development, including future phases, industrial and residential, showing the relationship to the proposed DOTD corridor connecting Highway 30 and the future I-10 interchange. Um, and require the applicant, number four, require the applicant to designate the approximate location for a future possible sewer treatment plant. So if and when this occurs, he will not be required to apply for a major revision to the preliminary plan. All right, we have a substitute motion by Mr. Chasson, a second by Mr. Furman. All in favor of Mr. Chasson's substitute motion, please raise your hand in front of the camera. Any in opposition? All right, I see uh, four to one and the chair votes in favor of the amended uh, petition to amended motion. So it's five to one, uh, the amended motion carries. Mr. Chairman, can, we cannot see who raised their hand and who did not. Uh, can, Mr. Furman, Mr. Hodgson, Mr. Furman, Mr. Hodgson, Mr. Dumas, Mr. Chasson, and the chair voted in favor. Mr. Carmouche voted against. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to 12C is Windermere Crossing. Um, if you want to step out and get Derek Murphy. Oh, wait, he's already there. We're going to grab the uh, developer as well. All right, if anybody needs a break, that was a rather long hearing. Take it now. The chair is going to take a break too. It's there. I will let you know when we're all ready. Bye. 
the uh, appropriate one. We're just waiting for Mr. Furman to get back. All right, everybody's here. Let's, uh, let's roll, Mr. Murphy. I want to introduce Ross Bruce, the developer for Windermere Crossing. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to present our case tonight to you in these unusual and difficult uh, circumstances. I'm here tonight with Brian Dent, my business partner, along with the team from Quality Engineering. Uh, before I turn it over to Derek, just a couple of uh, comments. Uh, we're proposing tonight Windermere subdivision, Windermere Crossing subdivision, a 103 lot subdivision on 35.35 acres, currently zoned RM. Uh, every proposed home site is out of the flood zone with the exception of the rear of one third, rear one third of one lot. On November 17th, we sent out a letter to the 17 adjacent property owners uh, introducing ourselves as a developer and requesting to set up phone calls to address any concerns they may have. As of tonight, I received uh, one call and I've spoken to that adjacent property owner. It is my understanding that this proposed uh, plat meets all uh, essential Paris subdivision ordinance as uh, submitted. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Derek. Good evening again. Uh, tonight we have on the table Windermere Cross. Uh, like Ross said, it's 103 lot subdivision uh, near the intersection of Cannon Road and Roddy. Uh, as you heard tonight in the public comment period, both by phone call and by email, uh, majority of all concerns in this region, of course, is traffic. Uh, there's several mentions of some substandard roads, intersections, so forth. And uh, we have to agree with them as far as Cannon Road is concerned. Uh, our original, our original uh, plat, our original plat that we looked at had a connection to Cannon Road. We changed this because of the substandard nature of Cannon Road and going to Roddy. Uh, if, you, if you recall, this was a this was a, a another subdivision that came before y'all in December of 2018 called Malfi Cove. The, the connection along Roddy was similar, uh, similar location. If you look at everything that we have went through during this process from start to finish, you will see that we have performed a detailed traffic analysis and a drainage analysis as well as presented a plat 
before you tonight that meets the code. Per staff, per staff review, it says the proposed plat meets all guidelines for a major subdivision per current, current ordinance. That is true. Uh, we've heard several commenters tonight talk about the need for our dual uh, uh, two entrances and exits. Uh, that is, uh, in my understanding, is not a requirement of Ascension Parish Code. If you also look in the traffic study on table three, or table three in the staff reports, you will see that Roddy Road at Black Bayou Road, Windermere full access, with a full access of connection to Roddy Road, you will see that we have some service level services of E. With that, we started regrouping and looking at things that we can do in order to mitigate that intersection level of service dropping. In order to do that, we have we decided to restrict access out of and into the development. So there's no left turns out of the development on Girardi Road. Uh, this eliminated the cars that were going in that direction, thus leaving the level of service at those intersections alone. With that mitigation element, we we. Uh, mitigated any impact we would have in this area. The intersection at Cannon and Roddy, of course, uh, does see an increase in cars, but does not drop the level of service, thus meeting the traffic impact policy at this time. Uh, let's talk about drainage a little bit. Hold on, Mr. Murphy, before you go to drainage, I have a question. Yes. So it's my understanding that it's a right turnout on the Roddy, correct? Yes, sir. Right there and out. And as I remember, Mount Cove, one of the problems is that there was an entrance and an exit onto Cannon Road, which was too short, too narrow uh, to meet the guidelines. And as a condition, uh, there was actually a motion to approve it, conditioned upon Cannon being widened from Roddy to Highway 44. That motion eventually failed. As far as I know, and I was out there two days ago, Cannon is still not wide enough to border a subdivision on. So if I'm if I move into Windermere Place and my kid goes to Central Elementary or Central Middle School and I have to take a right turn out onto Rogers so I can go south, wouldn't I then go up to basically Cannon Road, turn right, go down to O'Neill Road to make another right and go back up to I guess Germany or whatever is up there to get to central primary and central middle. In other words, aren't you robbing northbound traffic over that substandard road? Yes, sir. We are more. We are increasing the traffic on the peak by I think nine cars. Nine cars going to Cannon Road. Yes, sir. Okay. But it does not drop the level of service at Cannon and Roddy. Well, I'm not. And I'm not the, so worried the, about the that. I'm not worried about Cannon Road, because basically what you're effectively doing is you've cut off an entrance and exit onto Cannon Road, but you really didn't because traffic wanting to go that way seems to me will go down Cannon Road. We'll still be using it. Well, and a percentage of if we had a full access, a percentage will go out towards Cannon Road either way. This. This way, we added some cars, yes, going to Cannon. The code says you cannot connect. If we if we allow, or, or it is a public highway, it is, so the code is very specific about the connection to us, to the substandard road if the pavement does not, uh, is not 18 feet. But in many traffic analysis, we use roads that may be less than 18 feet as part of the overall traffic network uh, but the code specifically talks about connection to Canada. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chasson. Actually, it doesn't. It just says that no major or minor subdivision may be developed on any street, which is less than 18 feet in pavement width. It doesn't actually specify connection. 
and your subdivision, and particularly lots one and 103 are on Cannon. And basically by saying, well, we know we can't put an entrance on Cannon because it doesn't meet the requirements. So we're gonna wall that off and just force you to go out onto this other street, force you to take a right and go to Cannon that way, effectively does the same thing. And the problem is that particular 18 foot requirement is a safety issue because Cannon Road roads that are less than 18 feet wide are not safe. And forcing traffic to go to Cannon by virtue of making them make a right turn out of your subdivision and go to Cannon that way versus an exit direction on the Cannon doesn't change the fact that you're still developing a subdivision on a road that's less than 18 feet in width and you're forcing the traffic to go that way. So I, I would say it still doesn't meet section 17, 4 to 32 because of the way you're forcing the traffic to go to camp. Mr. Dumas, you had a question or a comment? Uh, uh, just a comment that lots one and 103 are technically not on Canon because there is a, there is a buffer parcel that is not part of those lots. Um, at least the way I interpret the code is, is, you know, technically they are separate from Canon because it's, they don't, the lots aren't next to Canon. Well, but my I'd issue, like to take this opportunity. Go ahead. I'd like, I'd like to take this other opportunity to, to, to talk further. One thing I want to make a presentation on is I, I do feel that this original does meet the letter of the law, uh, but I'd also want to, uh, let the commission know that we have been in pretty uh, uh, pretty lengthy discussions with the administration and staff over the next of the last couple of days, several days, uh, working with the developers, and uh, we feel that we actually looking at uh, maybe an alternate to what y'all have uh, presented to y'all tonight. That alternate is removal of the connection to Roddy Road, allowing a connection onto Cannon Road and requiring the developer to improve Cannon Road from, from the intersection of Roddy Road to Highway 44 to be for asphalt pavement to be greater than the 18 foot requirement. Is the developer uh, willing, willing to improve Cannon Road from Roddy to Highway 44? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you please That's elaborate on what improving that road mean? What does that encompass? Is it you adding six inches to get over 18 foot? Or I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to so elaborate so a little bit, please. In, in talking with the chief engineer uh, this week, uh, along with Jerome, and Jerome, you can come with this. John. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of give a brief you on what the administration and, and the staff has been talking to the developer with. Um, the developer is willing to, as Derek said, widen the road to 18 feet width, which is the requirement uh, to develop on, on a project connecting to it. All right, that's our interpretation of the ordinance. Um, they're willing to go there. We had a meeting with the chief engineer, Mr. Joey Tarot of the parish. We wanted to make sure that any improvements that they were gonna make met his qualifications. Um, we didn't want just a, an ordinary strip of asphalt being thrown on top of dirt. So they are willing to uh, construct the road to our standards per Mr. Turo. And uh, as Mr. Murphy said, from Roddy all the way to 44, all right? In further discussions with the administration, we also broached the idea of the developer putting up the money that would be equivalent to that construction. And, it, and the parish would pull parish money through what might be, and I say might be, uh, a, a move ascension project, right? This currently is not a move ascension project. You know, any com combination of funds with move ascension to any money that they would put in would require the uh, consent of the, of the council. All right, so we'd have to go to the parish council, get the approval to uh, allocate monies, you know, to, to widen the road. And if that were to occur, we would very likely be able to get a 20 foot wide road instead of an 18 foot wide road. 
but the developer what's on the table right now and what they've agreed to is widen the road to 18 feet and uh, which would meet, meets the requirement all the way from Roddy to 44. Well, let me just say, I think we can put up the condition to widen it to 20 feet if we desired, or maybe we can't. We got to probably meet the parish ordinance, but that's a the ordinance. If they, if the council wants to change it, needs to change it, and I think that's probably a good thing. We did that with um, that subdivision in Prairieville off of 932, and that road is now much better than it was. And I know there was DOT and DOTD involved in that. Um, but what I am not in favor of, what I am not in favor of, and I will say this on the record, is making that condition subject to a buyout where the money goes to the parish uh, for the move ascension projects. If we are going to put that as a condition, I would consider strongly voting for it, but only if it's a condition that the developer does it and cannot subsequently then pay money to get himself out of that condition because we've seen that go awry and I just think it looks bad. Um, but just saying that, I don't think, I think that accomplishes a lot of goals. So unless anybody has any other questions about traffic, Mr. Murphy, I know you wanted to address drainage. If I might address that concern, Mr. Chairman, yes. um, I'd, like to, I'd like to state that the road will have to be improved to eight, at least 18 feet width before any final plat would be approved on this project. All right. So any connection made to this to Cannon Road from this from this subdivision will have to at least be 18 feet width. I understand that. I just don't like the perception that we place a condition on something and a developer then can come in and say, well, I'm just going to pay the equivalent and let the parish decide where that money is going to go, which may not, then we, then we can't control where that goes. That takes it out of our hands. And if we're the planning commission, I think that's part of our planning obligation. Because I've seen in my time here too many, well, this is going to happen and it's going to happen in this timeline right. and it hasn't happened. So that's, that's, I understand what you're saying. I just don't like that idea. Uh, Mr. Carmus, you had a, your hand up. Yeah, be, being, being uh, probably the new one to all this, I'm, I'm not in favor of these sort of contingencies and promises and futures and stuff. I mean, I've I'm, I'm been taught that we were supposed to look at whether it meets it or not. Um, can we talk about the single interest and how that, all right, all right, uh, how, how does that envision to work? What, what barrier is going to prevent the left hand turn? Um, how's that going to work? There, there, are, there are standard details by DOTD and other entities that we would have to adhere to in order to make uh, for that connection. So it's a raised curve. Uh, things like that that you couldn't couldn't jump or cross over, uh, even maybe even some paddles in the road or something like that that we'd have to get approved and get through traffic engineering uh, and the ERA. Mr. Dubas, you have raised your hand. I, I was going to address one of Carmuch, Mr. McCarmuch's uh, comments, and that is that a lot of times throughout this analysis, you identify impacts and and um, and those impacts are above and beyond. Just because the subdivision meets code, there may be additional impacts that aren't addressed by the code. And that's what the purpose of a condition of approval is, is to address those impacts. So for example, as we look at this one, you know, something that hasn't been brought up. I brought this up the last time this property came up. The proximity of their access to right is real close to the bridge over the over the canal there and those guardrails are relatively high and I had an issue with the line of sight. So I actually, under that prior requirement, made a motion to require them to widen cannon. At that developer said, we're not willing to do that. The project died, notwithstanding the fact that the motion that the first agency denied the project. Unfortunately, this project does need code as is. Now the question before us is, my opinion, is it a better project that it does not connect to Roddy? It connects to Cannon and the developer improves Cannon from Roddy to 44 
to meet the parish standard. And that's where the conditions of approval kick on. And that's, and that's what the purpose of the conditions of approval, you know, needs to be. And, and frankly, if a condition doesn't have a rational nexus to do something like that, then it shouldn't be on the property, to be honest with you. But in this case, I believe that th this development meets code and to make it better and improve development that would enhance circulation and other matters in the parish. It's, it's a better development if it does not connect to Roddy and if the developer widens 44 from Roddy, I mean, canning from Roddy to 44 in a matter that is consistent with the parish standards to a minimum of the code requirement of 18 feet. As much as I'd like to go beyond 18 feet, that's the current code requirement. And I'll make that in the form of a motion, by the way. Okay, well, but Mr. Furman, you had a comment that you wanted to make. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm totally against, uh, against uh, the no no left turn coming out of Roddy, if that, uh, if that if, uh, is still an option. But um, I don't know how many of you have traveled to Adams, but I have. And there are parts of it that the, the base underneath where the asphalt goes will have to be built. It's going to be a major undertaking, and I'm not sure the developer fully understands how, how much he's going to have to do to accomplish what he says he's willing to do. That's not going to be an inexpensive project. Um, I would want to know much more about how the road he intends to widen the road. If it's just patching up the areas where the road narrows to 17, 17 and a half only, you know, I'd be totally against that because you're going to have to build everything. You have to build the foundation underneath that blacktop in some areas, not just not just put the blacktop. And uh, that, that is a very narrow road. I passed on it too many times with big trucks, and and um, it, it, it's it's very unsafe. And and uh, anyway, so I'm against the project based on that. Mr. Dubis, you want to permit it, if I may? I, I was going to say, I, I believe, I believe, if, if I did, if I didn't, if I understood. Uh, Jerome correctly, I believe that they, they've met with the parish engineer and they've gone over what standards that they're going to have to meet, you know, in order to satisfy the parish and they're well aware of those, so, you know, and Jerome, you can confirm that. Yeah, All right, but Mr. I'll Murphy, I'll let you uh, speak on this. Mr. Chairman, speak? Yes. Yes. Sorry. So, so we went out and surveyed, uh, went out and surveyed the asphalt. Uh, it's 5,200 linear feet of roadway that we would need to improve from Roddy Road to Highway 44. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of driveways, businesses. Uh, the asphalt is typically uh, uh, greater than 17 feet, with about 50% of the asphalt over 17 and a half. But there is a lot of areas that is at least a little over half that is under 17 and a half feet. What we propose to do, talking to Joey Turo, uh, some contractors, is we're gonna go on one side of that. The, the, the good thing about all this is, is that the top bank, from top bank to top bank on the ditches is relatively above 21 feet up to 23 foot wide uh, based on our survey data that we have. So, you know, our construction techniques are gonna be when we're going one side of the road and you dig out 12 inches wide, about 10 inches deep. Uh, you dig that completely out on the side and you fill that full depth asphalt in order to get a base. Then we're gonna come back in on top of that. And we're gonna put an inch and a half overlay on the entire road uh, in order to, to make it basically increase the design service life. This road was actually at one point uh, paved by the uh, parish itself uh, back in the end of 2015 before the flood and uh, put in the condition it is. So it had, and that was a complete reconstruction with soil cement uh, and three inches of asphalt. So we're gonna add an inch and a half of asphalt on top of the existing asphalt of three inches and uh, extend the life of this road probably uh, an additional 15 to 20 years. Uh, so we're not just going to be tacking on to the side. The parish is going to allow that. We're going to have to come in with construction plans. Same thing on, uh, we did. On, we were part of the project on 930, so it was Dan Bruce. 
uh, that project went very well. We know what it's going to take. We know what it's going to cost. We've already talked to the contractors. We talked to the chief engineer. We worked with the parish. So we've done a lot of leg work up front. We know what it's going to cost. And these guys are willing to do that. And I think it's uh, it could be a good project for the area if the parish can come in and uh, from a from a standpoint and and make it a wider project and meet our timeline. That's even better for everyone. But right now we know what it's going to take from a cost standpoint, timeline standpoint, in order to get the road 18 feet wide, and it's not a piecemeal uh, type construction. It's a full reconstruction. I guess I'd feel better if it was underway and you can see the progress, but um, I would well, understand this, this, this project has to be 100 seconds after the road is done. Well, I don't, I don't think that they're going to start improving the road based on the, the hope that we'll, that we'll pass their, approve their subdivision. But as I understand it too, Mr. Murphy, um, if, if the road is going to get improved, then you're going to, uh, open the entrance onto Cannon Road and make it both ways on Roddy. Is that correct? No, sir. Well, our, 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 our proposal would be to eliminate the Roddy Road connection and only have the Cannon Road connection. So still only one exit. When well, they consider, well, they consider yeah. it. So you would have a full access on Cannon with an improved road from Highway 44 all the way to Roddy Road. I, I, I'm not well, for that. And, and look, we have to be a motion to make the condition to have Roddy Road and Cannon Road as two entrances. It is a preference in the code. It is not mandatory. It's a should, not a shall. Which does make a difference in the legal. Uh, Mr. Chasson, and then Mr. Uh, if we're going, so as submitted to us, it's an entrance on Roddy. Now we're talking about either getting rid of Roddy and an entrance on Cannon or an entrance on both Roddy and Cannon. Does the traffic impact study even consider either of those issues? I mean, would we need a new traffic impact study to, to, to change that drastically? The preliminary plan that was submitted to us, where where you're completely changing the access. The original. Uh, we'll let Sean Chiro answer that. No, we do not have a traffic study that has a, an option of only Cannon Road. Even a Mountain Cove never considered uh, Cannon Road as the only sole access, so we do not have a study. We got the. We have done one internally and checked, and, and the level of service does work. It does meet the policy. The, that's never been submitted to the parish or as part of any document submitted to us. Submitting it on that. I think our options are either to require both entrances or uh, leave it as is. Because obviously both entrances would relieve the traffic. Uh, Mr. Karmish or Mr. Hodgson's and Mr. Karmish. That was my question is I would be in favor of uh, the widening of uh, Cannon as proposed, but also keeping the other entrance as well. Well, two entrances is, is good. You know, yeah. we, we need two entrances better, wider right. road is better, and as is, uh, I don't think it's going to pass. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Then, then, we, then we ask that y'all adhere to what we submitted because, from a cost prohibitive standpoint, we cannot do the connection on Roddy and Widen Cannon Road. I think the problem that we have, Mr. Murphy, if we want to widen Cannon Road. We don't have a traffic impact study to know that that's going to meet that. I think that should have been submitted as an alternative. Mr. Dumas has a point he would like to make. Well, we can definitely, we can definitely allow that to be a stipulation. So, so this is really a question to, to Sean and, and Jerome. If we condition if we condition this project to have the one access, connect the can, wind the can, subject to them presenting a traffic report that meets the policy of that one connection, would that be suitable to, to the two of you Yeah, I mean, the 
process of e-review and a traffic study, uh, it doesn't change. It's, it's really it's a decision, in my opinion, on the planning commission. Is that acceptable to you for us to do that analysis? If we were able to make, you know, present it back and forth as possible. So, you, I work at the direction of the planning commission. If you'd like me to review a study, and your condition is that there's no drops of level services per the traffic study, then that, that's what I. That's what I'll do. Yeah, I, I still have an issue with, with, with the Roddy and the line of sight issue from a safety perspective, and that's why I don't like it. So for me, it's not a traffic issue, it's, it's a line of sight issue. They, they have done analysis on the, uh, if you're talking about a sight distance, uh, Mr. Dumas, they have done the analysis and it's shown that there's sufficient sight distance should we continue to pursue the connection to Roddy. You can only consider the future guardrail and uh, bridge widening. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be, and I don't know, I don't know about the rest of us young guys. So we're, we're talking about a connection to Cannon Road with a developer improving a sub, uh, was considered a substandard road parish, free of charge for taxpayers of over five thousand feet in order to be allowed to do the connection. And having that completely done prior to the final plaque coming back in front of this body to make it sure that it meets everything from a code with, uh, uh, you know, by stipulation of the engineers. So if I'm looking at this correctly, the traffic impact study indicates that we have full access that we have used at a couple of intersections below the level of service of D. So two access actually worsens the traffic conditions. I'd also like to point out uh, in, in, in my interpretation of shall and should, should indicates an obligation or a duty and shall uh, actually is a strong assertion. So it's, it's, I guess that's, you know, how you interpret that. So when I see that should have a single entrance or, or more, than, more than one entrance, uh, you know, that's that's an obligation in, in my view. Uh, I want to I want to address this and um, I mean, it, it, and Aaron, you can back me up on this, and I know O'Neill can back me up on this. I mean, the difference between should and shall is a mandatory versus mandatory. But aside from that point, I travel down quite a bit every morning, and I know traffic backs up there. And one of the concerns in thinking about this as an exit on Roddy is people turning left because there will be traffic backed up at Cannon that you can't, it will prevent people from seeing down Roddy to the south. I'm not sure about the sight line to the north. I know Julio is concerned about that bridge. I'm just wondering, left turning traffic coming out onto Roddy would probably, and I don't have any evidence other than my thought on this, increase the likelihood of accidents there. Left turning coming out on any limited roadway like that. Um, the improvement at Cannon Road, though, is really an attractive option. I don't think there'd be as much traffic on Cannon um, to allow left turn and right turn in and out there. Well, and, in, and in, Mr. Chairman, to, to make your point earlier, if you're coming out of Cannon, you're probably going toward the four lane highway, which is gonna be Highway 44, which is gonna be completely improved and not going through the intersections of, of Cannon and Roddy and Black Bayou and Roddy as well, which is some of the, some of the indications. Yeah, maybe, so maybe not. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's that certainly seems plausible. On the two entrances, though, there's a lot of argument. I used to live in the neighborhood with two entrances, and every year in the wintertime, we had a problem with uh, thieves coming in, and they would just make a circuit through the neighborhood, in one entrance and out the other, uh, pulling door handles and things like that. You talk to people, some people love it because it gives them multiple access. Some people hate it because they don't want undesirables coming through the neighborhood and stealing their stuff. So there's an argument for and against um, uh, the multiple entrances on that. So I don't know where it comes down with uh, Mr. Chassa. I know you have an opinion on this. Usually the opinion depends on 
what it was like when you moved in. The problem with the with that submitted where I'm talking about having only one entrance on on Roddy, and then they'll eventually tie into Canon when Canon is fixed. Is by the time the Canon gets fixed, and there are people who live in that subdivision, they're going to be against the tie in Roddy because they're going to say yeah, the, oh, the proposal like is to fix Canon before the final plat gets approved and connect only to Canon. I think that was Mr. Dumas's motion. Right, and then and bear in mind that final plan means there are no building permits, so there'd be no houses there. No so houses no until houses. until the build, no houses built, certainly no uh, certificates of occupancy or anything else until Canon is fixed and there's access onto what would be considered an acceptable road. But the code still prefers two entrances, and the, and it doesn't prefers, say shall, but, but doesn't it, mandate. But you can't mandate because the the way oh, some good. pieces of property are going to be situated, they're going to be landlocked, and it's not going to be physically possible to have two entrances. So you can't mandate something because it's not going to be doable in all circumstances. But in this one, it is. Uh, there, there is a viable option to have an entrance onto two roads. And if you're going to do that, you need to do it before anybody moves in. So I think if you're going to approve it, you have to have the entrance on Cannon and you have to have the entrance on Roddy. And the only way you can do Cannon is if Cannon is wide to comply with 1742. I'd like to say that last month, this commission, I was a part of this commission on another project where the option, the option was there in order to do three connections uh, and, and this body uh, chose to, to do only have a single connection. And I know that was extenuating circumstances because of the neighbors and so forth. But what I, what I want to make sure of is that we know a single entrance is allowed. It's it's allowed but not preferred. Yeah, but uh, in this case, you have, you have a, a, a traffic issue, you have a risk issue, and a line of sight issue, in my opinion. So I think that you have to weigh those things in when the, when you look at a preferred option, is it in the best interest of the parish to do that, or is it in the best interest of the parish to not do that? And in this case, I think it's in the best interest of the parish to not do that because of those other prevailing issues. All right, well, Mr. Dumas, did you make a motion, a formal motion? Let me and make so can you go ahead and repeat it? Yeah, let me make a motion. So I make a motion to approve uh, the preliminary plan with the waiver of density subject to the following. They have only one access onto Cannon Road. They have to improve Cannon Road to the minimum parish standard in accordance with the Department of Public Works requirements from Roddy to Highway 44. Uh, they have to eliminate the access to Roddy and they have a maximum lots of 133, 103 lots, excuse me. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second of that motion? I make a substitute motion. Did, Matt, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, substitute motion to approve with the connection on Rotten and the connection on Cannon with the requirement that the developer widen Cannon to 18 feet to comply with 17, 40, 32 from the intersection of Roddy all the way to Highway 44, and that the, that be done in accordance with consultation and approval from the uh, parish with regards to the standards of building the road. All right, we have a substitute motion. Do we have a second on the substitute motion? Second, motion by Mr. Chasson, second on the substitute motion. All in favor on the on the substitute motion, please raise your hands. Uh, Mr. Chasson, Mr. Furman, Mr. Hodgson. 
All opposed? Mr. Carmouche, the chair votes against. Mr. Dumas votes against. So the substitute motion fails. So, so commission, if we could, another alternative would be to keep the keep the connection on the Roddy and only improve Cannon Road from Roddy to O'Neill, thus uh, for a sort of shorter section on Cannon, but it allows us the connection on the Roddy, but it's still going to be from a traffic impact policy standpoint, it's still going to be a uh, basically restricted access. Do we have a motion on that? I'll make that motion. All right, so the motion is that uh, to approve with the condition that everything stays the same except that the Cannon Road is improved to, from Rock Road to O'Neill Land. Well, we also need to approve the including the waiver for the density and the maximum lots of 103. Okay. Do we have a second on that motion? I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Would Would that allow uh, turning on right road either direction, right and left? No, it has still have to be a restricted access because of the Black Bayou and Roddy Road interchange intersection. So no left turn on Roddy. You would have to Yeah, unless, unless you can they stipulate the You can stipulate the motion to pull access. Left turn on Roddy, I'll be honest with you. Okay, everybody, I couldn't understand. Could everybody move except the person talking, which right now is me? Uh, I don't think I'd be in favor of an unprotected left turn on Roddy. In the morning time, there's too much traffic backed up at the four way stops. People come flying out of there. I just think that's really dangerous. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm inquiring what his intentions are. In, uh, it, would be a, it, it would need to be a restricted access on the Roddy, yes. Which means right turn only? Yes. That's what that means, yeah. So just so I'm clear on the motion, so your right turn only on Tarati and entrance on the Cannon, but only watching Cannon to O'Neill. Is that right. the motion? Is that what you is that what you propose, Mr. Murphy? Yes, sir. Two entrances with a restricted entrance in body and widening only to O'Neill. Yes, sir. Mr. So is that what he's saying? The understanding of your motion. Is he saying two entrances? Two entrances. Wait, everybody move except me for a second. So I can make this clear. And I'll let Mr. Murphy and Mr. Dumas, who made the motion, clarify. Two entrances. The entrance on Roddy restricted to a right turn in and out only. Um, entrance onto Cannon, widening Cannon from Roddy to O'Neill Lane. Mr. Murphy, is that correct? Except for a left turn in to the entrance off of Roddy. The okay, only so thing we're going to restrict the entrance out. Correct. All right, Mr. Dumas, was that the understanding that you made on your motion? That's the understanding of what he's proposing. And when I said that is if we want to consider that, we need to also add the waiver to the density and put a condition of the maximum lots of 103. I would encourage the commissioners to reconsider the other motion, which is a far improved circulation and certainly in the best interest of the parish. Okay. So the motion by Mr. Dumas is as I stated with the density waiver and the limitation of lots with his encouragement to go back to the original motion. But we have that second motion by Mr. Dumas. Is there a second on the second motion? You're not, you're not unmuted, Ken. Could you repeat the motion that we're voting on? All right. Go ahead, Julio. Uh, it moved to approve the subdivision, uh, including the waiver to the density, maximum lots of 103, access to can add the access to Canon with a requirement that the widened Canon 
from Roddy to O'Neill Lane in accordance to the parish uh, requirements in DCW Access to Roddy will be uh, right turn in, right turn out only. And a left turn in. And a left turn in. No restriction on, on Cannon Road, on access to Cannon Road. No restriction. No, that would be because we're we're improving Cannon. So no restriction. Okay. Does everybody yes. understand the motion? Is that a second, Mr. Hodgson? Yes. All right. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Mr. Furman votes in favor. Mr. Dumas and Mr. Hodgson, I assume you're voting in favor since it was your motion. And second. All right. Chair votes in favor. All in opposition. Mr. Chasson and Mr. Carmouche. So the motion carries uh, by a vote of four to two. Thank y'all so much. Uh, item number 13 on the agenda is the Ansel Tomplay property, lots 5A through 53. This is old business, our favorite family partition. Mr. Fournier, do you need to go get everybody? Mr. Chairman, can you give us a second to get organized here, please? Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> it's almost 9 o'clock, so please make your seconds brief. All right. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to disconnect our conference room and reconnect to try and fix a display issue that we have. We can't see everyone on screen, so I'll try and fix that during this break. I'll be right back. Mr. Chairman, we're set here. Well, we don't have everybody back yet, so we got a few minutes. Every, all the old guys needed to go pee. Yeah. 
I want to know how Eric manages through these meetings without dinner. All right. Looks like we're all back. Let's roll. Okay. Mr. Chairman, this matter was heard before the commission last month. There were some signatures, if you guys remember, there were some signatures missing from the map when it was recorded. The applicant has uh, gotten the three signatures that were missing from the map originally. And what he is asking is that a motion be made and approved by the Planning Commission to reinstate approval of the, the map that has been recorded that was removed at last month's meeting. And when you do that, to include the instrument number as stated in the uh, write up, stamp write up in your packet is 959-447. The pre-dialect uh, servitude has been executed, and if you approve to reinstate your approval, that uh, servitude agreement will be recorded with the minutes, with the instrument number uh, reference, so that they can tie the two together. All right. So has everybody, every every one of the neighboring landowners who were required to sign originally when we approved it, have they signed off on the map? Yes. Any the correct signatures? Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have a motion to reinstate the plat? Chairman, can we ask you to make the motion and mention the number, please? So I'll make the motion that. What's the number? Hold on, hold on, Julio. What's the number? 959447. Go ahead. Yes. So I'll make the motion to reinstate the plat. Uh, instrument number 959447, and that it, and that the minutes be recorded with the exec, fully executed and notarized pre uh servitude. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Furman. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Hodgson. All in favor? Mr. Chasson's in favor. Mr. Furman's in favor. Mr. Hodgson's in favor. Mr. Dumas in favor. Mr. Carmich in favor. Unanimous motion passes. Item number 14. Motion to adjourn. Everybody move. All right. I don't know how long it's going to take to reboot for zoning. But we are adjourned pending the zoning meeting. Yeah. We have another meeting. Yeah. Same people. Yeah. You don't want to roll right into it? Yeah. John has a all right, let me go check with the...